Botulinum toxin is a very potent neurotoxic protein that's commonly used in the medical and cosmetic fields for a variety of treatments. While many scientists often argue over the levels of toxicities in various substances, they mostly agree that despite its commercial usage, botulinum toxin is one of the most toxic substances that exists. So what would happen if you ate botulinum toxin, the most deadly poison in the world? Could you survive? Botulinum toxin comes from a bacteria that produces the toxin under certain circumstances, and there are three primary ways humans get it into their bodies – through food, through a wound like a cut, or as a baby because of a weak immune system. So in this case, you've swallowed the toxin and it's now entering your body. Depending on how much you consume, it can begin taking effect and displaying symptoms anywhere from two hours all the way to eight days. No matter how long or short it takes for these symptoms to start appearing, they're usually always the same. The first thing that happens is a flaccid paralysis, a fancy way of saying that you start losing muscle control, which affects your ability to walk, talk, see, and even swallow. Something that makes botulinum toxin even scarier is what it doesn't do, which is cause you to pass out. Most patients are conscious and aware of what's happening to their bodies as they slowly lose control. And once it starts happening, there's not much you can physically do to reverse it. Following the loss of ability to communicate and swallow, your eyes will likely start sagging and vision will blur. You may even begin seeing double or hallucinating. The whole process feels like your body is just slowly and painfully shutting down, with no control or means to stop it. The next thing that would happen would be the loss of the protective gag reflex and total paralysis of respiratory muscles. This is bad, very bad. Because without these crucial body parts functioning, you would have to immediately be put on a ventilator and endotracheal intubation. Basically, this means in an emergency situation, doctors will put a small tube down your throat and into the trachea to maintain an open airway. And despite the rapid progression of paralysis throughout the body, unfortunately, you'll feel every bit of pain, temperature, and touch. If you were lucky enough to have caught the illness fast enough, you might be able to stabilize your body, but at this point in time, there's no way to quickly reverse the paralysis. If you do survive, it may take several months or years to fully recover motor nerve endings, and in some severe cases, you may never fully recover. If not treated at all or caught quick enough, death is imminent via airway obstruction or respiratory failure caused by the paralysis of your diaphragm and breathing muscles. In a nutshell, consuming botulinum toxin, the most toxic poison in the world, doesn't sound like a fun experience. It will be very painful, frightening, confusing, and will most likely end with death. So although it has many commercial uses in different dosages and applications, please do not eat it for fun or on a dare. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button and be sure to subscribe for more great episodes of Fuzzy and Nuts. Fuzzy and Nuts have been busy guiding us through history, and their last adventure took us to some of the greatest natural disasters in history. But today, we're going to take a closer look at some of those disasters and how they affected life on Earth as we look at the greatest extinctions in history. Today, oxygen is vital to all life on Earth, and it's impossible to picture the Earth without its signature blue oceans and clear skies full of fresh oxygen. But our young Earth looked much different than it does today. Its oceans were saturated with iron, and what little oxygen there was would bind with that iron to produce rust and turn the entire planet red. In the air, methane from constant volcanic eruptions blanketed the planet and would have made the air poisonous to life today. So what changed exactly? Well, the first step towards the Earth of today started in the oceans with a single bacteria which through random genetic mutation evolved the ability to photosynthesize. This lonely little guy was able to use the sun's energy to turn water and carbon dioxide into energy-rich glucose, producing up to 16 times more energy than any other bacteria in the world. This supercharged bacteria immediately began to outcompete its neighbors and started reproducing at a massive rate. Eventually, this bacteria, known as cyanobacteria, had completely dominated all simple life in the oceans. And if that wasn't enough, it sealed the fate of all its competitors with the byproduct of its photosynthesis, oxygen. As the cyanobacteria released oxygen, most of it was trapped by the iron in the water. But as the cyanobacteria grew in numbers, they overwhelmed the ocean's ability to absorb all that oxygen, releasing it into the atmosphere. The only problem is that for all other life on Earth, oxygen was poisonous, which led to the extinction of nearly all other primitive life forms. 
While the oxygen released would fill our atmosphere with the oxygen we needed to survive and turn most of the iron in the oceans to rust, which would then sink and give us today's blue waters we love so much. Over 2 billion years ago, this little bacteria that could was responsible for one of the greatest mass extinctions in history. Today, the Appalachian Mountains are home to thousands of people and for most bring up fond memories of pleasant afternoons enjoying some of the most impressive displays of fall colors anywhere in the world. But those same mountains harbor a deep, dark secret. Scientists suspect that they are the culprits of one of the Earth's greatest murder sprees. 444 million years ago, graptolites were tiny creatures that clumped together into large colonies and fed on plankton and other tiny bits of food. They covered the bottom of the world's oceans and drifted along its currents as one of the dominant forms of life on our primitive Earth. Unknown to the tiny creatures, their doom came when the plate tectonics forced the Iapetus ocean plate to collide and sink under the North American plate. As one plate was forced under the other, the Appalachians began to grow and to be lifted up out of the sea. Full of silicate rock, the newly born Appalachians began to absorb CO2 out of the air, removing the greenhouse gas from the atmosphere and causing an ice age. The subsequent freezing would wipe out 86% of all life on Earth and make graptolites extinct. For the worst mass extinction by far though, we have to return back to just before the dinosaurs, 251 million years ago, and the eruption of the Siberian Traps. Last time we learned about the explosion of volcanic activity in modern day Siberia and how it flooded an area the size of the US in lava. But with eruptions lasting an incredible 2 million years, they filled the atmosphere with CO2, which trapped the sun's heat and scorched the earth. If that wasn't enough, all that carbon fed specific types of bacteria that used it to create energy and spewed out methane adding yet another layer of insulation to the sweltering planet. As global temperatures surged, the oceans acidified and became a toxic soup, belching out poisonous hydrogen sulfide, known as the Great Dying by scientists. This chain of catastrophes almost completely eliminated life on Earth and set evolution back over 300 million years by wiping the slate clean. Life has had some incredibly close calls, but in the end it all led to us here today. Sometimes though, we could all use a reminder of just how lucky we are to be here at all and learn to get along together. Fuzzy and Nuts are on a trip through the Earth's history, showing us what it was like to live with dinosaurs, what the greatest natural disasters ever were, and the worst extinctions ever on Earth. But now they find themselves at the dawn of our own history, two and a half million years in the past. The Stone Age began in what was called the Paleolithic Era, approximately two and a half million years ago, and ended at around 9000 BC with the rise of human civilization. The Stone Age is so called because it's primarily known for the use of stone tools by man and his ancestors, and marks the first time in known history when any animal developed the ability to build and use advanced tools, such as flint tip spears and arrows. Many animals even today use sticks and even rocks as tools to hunt or communicate, but the use of stone tip spears and other primitive stone implements was a huge leap in intelligence that set man and his ancestors apart. For much of the Stone Age, the Neanderthals reigned supreme. Though typically pictured as crude brutes with little intelligence, Neanderthals were actually very intelligent and are credited with discovering fire. They also developed primitive art forms such as cave paintings, and recent discoveries in France show that they even had some basic rituals for the dead hinting at a primitive form of spirituality. Neanderthals, however, would go to decline about 40,000 years ago with the appearance of Cro-Magnon Man, an early version of the modern man. Cro-Magnon was more intelligent than its Neanderthal cousins, as evidenced by the discovery of finely crafted stone and bone tools, shell and ivory jewelry, and advanced cave paintings made with paints of multiple dyes. Eventually, Neanderthals would go extinct, and modern man would arise to make the world we live in today. But what was it really like in the Stone Age? Well, for starters, it was cold. The Stone Age is also known as the Ice Age, as the 2.6 million year long period of cold temperatures began almost the same time as the Stone Age and only ended 11,700 years ago. That means that for most of the Stone Age, it was cold with temperatures on average 12 degrees colder than they are today. Huge glaciers covered the northern hemisphere, and it was during this time that some of the largest mammals to ever live existed, such as the woolly mammoth. For early man, the woolly mammoth was a prey item, though the hunts were extremely dangerous and only successful because of man's ability to build spears and communicate complex ideas, allowing hunting packs of men to strategize and overcome the massive beasts. 
However, more fearsome predators than man also lived during this time, the most famous of all being the saber-toothed tiger, who would have made a quick meal out of any hunter. Despite popular opinion in Hollywood diets though, man did not primarily eat meat, but rather existed on a combination of fruits, berries, nuts, grains, and the occasional meat from a successful hunt. We know this because of the wear patterns on ancient teeth and the discovery of grains in early man sites. For most of the Stone Age, man lived on the move, a nomadic lifestyle that followed herds of animals and migrated to warmer climates during the winter. This meant that Neanderthals and other early ancestors actually had some basic knowledge of astronomy, as watching the sky and recognizing the stars above your head and their positions in the sky could tell you when winter was coming and when it was time to move. Ignoring the stars was a good way to die off. It's thought that this early watching of the night sky led to the roots of spirituality and religion, with early man assigning special meaning to the mysterious wandering stars, the sun, and the moon. What started off as a survival strategy for a nomadic animal would end up being the start of all the world's modern religions. Man got his start millions of years ago as a group of apes left the trees to wander the savanna standing on two feet, surviving dangerous predators and the rigors of a two and a half million year long ice age. Man would go on to dominate the world he lives in and shape it to his will. Nuclear power plants are one of the biggest producers of energy in the world currently providing about 11% of the world's total electricity production. Nuclear reactors work by using the energy released from the splitting of atoms to produce steam, which in turn powers a turbine that generates electricity. Nuclear power is statistically very safe, but what might happen to you if there's an accident? It's impossible for a nuclear reactor to blow up like a bomb. But what if you were exposed to the highly radioactive spent fuel rods? Radiation is dangerous because it causes damage directly to the cells that make up your body, breaking chemical bonds and mutating your DNA. A very quick and low dose may leave you feeling just a little ill, like you have the flu, and your chances of recovery are quite high. A slightly higher or more prolonged exposure will start killing off blood cells and damage bone marrow and you'd most likely need a blood transfusion to survive. The radiation at this level will also start burning your skin, a very unhealthy way to get a tan. At an even higher dosage, your internal organs will be permanently damaged. Your brain and circulatory system will start to shut down, and while the exact level of exposure may mean that you'll live anywhere from a couple of weeks to just a few hours, death is almost certain. But just because you were able to survive the short-term effects doesn't mean you're safe. Exposure to radiation carries with it a hugely increased risk of cancer and other health problems later in life. And while there aren't any reports outside of comic books and movies of someone gaining superpowers from nuclear radiation, we'll let you know if we hear anything. Whether it's a jalapeno, a serrano, or even the infamous ghost pepper, we all have a heat threshold or level of spiciness that we can tolerate. But can anyone handle the Carolina Reaper? And what would happen if you ate it? The Carolina Reaper, a hybrid pepper specifically bred to be as hot as possible, is the current record holder for hottest pepper in the world. The Scoville heat scale is used to measure the spiciness of peppers. To put things in perspective, a jalapeno comes in at around 8,000 units, a habanero is a blistering 350,000 units, while a Carolina Reaper tops the scale at a whopping 2.2 million units. So what happens when you eat a pepper this spicy? First, the high concentration of capsaicin, the chemical that causes spiciness in peppers, binds to a nerve receptor in your mouth. This triggers an intense and extremely painful burning sensation. Obviously, there's no actual heat emanating from the pepper, but your brain is tricked into thinking that your mouth is on fire and that you're burning up. And since the brain believes you're overheating, it immediately takes corrective action to flush out the toxin. You'll experience extreme sweating accompanied by crying eyes and a runny nose. You might think it would get better once you start to digest the pepper, but you'd be wrong. The pepper continues to wreak havoc on your insides, resulting in severe pain and nausea that can last for up to 8 hours. And while it won't kill you or cause any permanent damage, there's not much you can do at that point but suffer and wait it out. Keep in mind, you can alleviate some of the painful burning in your mouth by drinking milk, which contains casein, a protein that neutralizes the pepper's capsaicin. So think long and hard before biting into one of those super spicy peppers. This bear is just going to have to stick to bell peppers for now. Tsunamis are well established as one of the most powerful and destructive natural disasters. But have you ever wondered what would happen if you were hit by one of these giant waves? And whether you'd survive such a catastrophe? A tsunami can occur after an earthquake, volcanic eruption, 
or a comparable disturbance under the ocean that is capable of displacing massive volumes of water. And while the Pacific Ocean's ring of fire is considered the most active zone, tsunamis occur in oceans and large bodies of water all over the world. It's believed that the earthquake responsible for the devastating Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004 released as much energy as 20,000 atomic bombs. When it's way out in the deep ocean, a tsunami is barely visible on the water's surface, even as it travels great distances at speeds up to 500 miles per hour. A warning that may indicate the imminent arrival of these killer waves is the sudden receding of the ocean from the coast. And while you may be tempted to take a closer look, you should do the exact opposite. Evacuate the area immediately ideally to higher ground, hills, or mountains. But if there's not enough time to escape, find a sturdy vertical structure to climb and get as high above the approaching water as you can. As the shockwave approaches land, all that energy transforms the water into a colossal wall that can reach heights of over 100 feet. And once it crashes ashore, a tsunami will obliterate everything in its path. The rapidly rising and turbulent water smash homes and toss cars around like toys as additional waves follow. The final round of devastation occurs when the massive amount of water reverses course to return to the sea, dragging everything in its path along with it and most tragically sucking people under along the way. If you're swept up in the current, try to grab onto something that floats, like a door or a fallen tree, and prepare to experience the terror described by some survivors as being a human pinball battered by debris from all directions. <laughs> and with so much destruction, it may be quite some time before help is on the way. So it's always a good idea to be prepared with an evacuation plan for you and your family. Justin, Oxygen, it makes up 21% of the atmosphere on Earth, and it's something human beings and many other species need to survive. And we even need more when we exercise. The more your body works, the more oxygen it needs, so you start breathing heavier. If you try and push past the point where you can get enough oxygen for your body, then you'll feel out of breath, and your lungs may even feel like they're burning. But is there a way to relieve this uncomfortable sensation? Maybe a trick to get in more oxygen than you can normally breathe? What if you drank liquid oxygen? Would it make you feel less out of breath? Would it give you more oxygen? And most importantly, would it hurt? But wait! First of all, under absolutely no circumstances should you try this at home. Fuzzy and Nuts are professionals, so let's leave the testing to them. Now let's do a little detective work and figure out what liquid oxygen is. When oxygen is cooled below the beyond bone-chilling temperature of negative 238 degrees Fahrenheit, it will form into a beautiful pale blue cryogenic liquid. Liquid oxygen is widely used in both the industrial and medical fields and has even been used as an oxidizer propellant for liquid-fueled rockets. An oxidizing agent is a substance that has the ability to accept other electrons. Through a chemical reaction, liquid oxygen can accept and gain other electrons from other atoms. In some rockets, that means combining liquid hydrogen and oxygen together in a way that forms water and also releases a tremendous amount of energy. Liquid oxygen has also been used in medicine as a clean oxygen source for patients, though they're breathing the oxygen as it warms and turns back into a gas, not drinking it. But if breathing in pure oxygen can be good for you, would drinking give you a boost as well? Think again, it probably won't, and most likely the experience will be incredibly painful and very uncomfortable. In fact, it could even mean the end of you. If you manage to somehow get the liquid into your stomach, it would boil and eventually create a lot of gas, and we mean a lot. Even if you burped non-stop, your stomach would likely still explode from the pressure. Luckily, in reality, you wouldn't really be able to drink it. Any tissue or organic matter that would come in relatively close proximity to it would die instantly from freezing. Think frostbite on steroids. It could also shatter your jaw, throat, and everything else that froze due to the severe and rapid temperature change, just like the way a hot piece of glass under cold water can explode. Drinking liquid oxygen would not go well. It certainly won't make you feel less out of breath and will do absolutely nothing for your physical performance. Although it does have legitimate medical and scientific purposes, there's no reason to ever try and drink it. 
so that next time you work out and catch yourself breathing heavily, just remember it will go away. It will get better. And the more you do it, the better you'll feel. So skip the liquid oxygen and stick to regular old stuff in the air. Your non-shattered jaw will thank you. Ouija boards are a centuries-old idea that people claim can help the living connect to the spirit world. Although some version has been in use since as early as 1100, the version we think of today can be traced back to the early 1800s, when people became especially interested in the supernatural and spiritualism. One thing is for sure, many people have scary stories and others have just been plain spooked by their family and friends. A Ouija board, either store-bought or homemade, must have certain attributes to be complete. A flat board with all the letters of the alphabet, a yes and a no at either corner of the board, and a goodbye at the bottom to sign off from the spirit world. The planchette is a pointed flat disc that all participants gently place their fingers on. It moves to different letters and words around the board. But who's moving the planchette? The spirits, or is it just you and your friends? In the long history of the board, there are certainly some spooky stories floating around out there. Once a young man brought home his brand new Ouija board. His mother warned him not to play it alone. As the story goes, you should never play the game alone or spirits might come in and possess you. The boy didn't pay attention to his mother's warning, and when he placed the planchette on the board, it went shooting across the room. Sounds like he's lucky that's all that happened. In another scary story, a young woman brought a Ouija board to the gravesite of her grandparents in the hope that she'd be able to speak with them again. When they began playing the Ouija board on top of the graves, the ground began sinking beneath them. There's even a whole series of books supposedly written by a spirit through a Ouija board. In the early 1900s, Pearl Coran claimed to have written several novels dictated to her by a spirit through her Ouija board. I wonder what other books might have been written by ghosts. Can you think of any? But whether they're real or not, you can definitely play some fun pranks on your friends to make them think the spirits are reaching out through the Ouija. When you know your friends are going to be playing the game, have someone turn the lights on and off. Just make sure no one sees you sneaking away. What about convincing your friends the board has possessed you? You'll need to have good acting skills for this one. Set up the board and create a very spooky atmosphere. Turn out all the lights and only have battery-powered flashlights or candles. Slightly move the Ouija planchette toward a ghostly name and start taking on that ghostly persona as the game goes on. You can even change your voice and come up with a creepy backstory. For the next one, you'll need to do a little preparation first. Set up the board on a light table, maybe like a small coffee table, but don't put any candles around it this time. You'll see why soon. Before you invite over your victim, uh, we mean friend, tape a spoon to your wrist and hide it under a long sleeve. Then, when you sit at the table and place your hands on the planchette, slide your arm so that the spoon is under the table. Now, by raising your arm slightly, you can make the table seem to float up and move on its own. This is a great one to use on a friend who has been tricked once or twice already and thinks they've seen all the tricks. If you really want to ramp up the frights, prepare your whole house for a haunt. Take old toilet paper rolls, cut out different shapes for eyes, and place glow sticks inside. Hide them all around the room where you'll play the Ouija. Just make sure the lights stay on until the right moment. Cut out a large black silhouette of a scary tall figure. Hang it up behind a door or at the end of a long hallway, somewhere that your guests won't see when first entering the room. Have a friend hide in a creepy costume in a closet or a nearby room, and they can jump out and scare your friends at just the right time. Once you've planned out all your scares, sit down and let the pranks commence. Try to rig up a switch to turn off the lights or have a friend switch the lights off at the circuit breaker. Get ready for the fun to start because your friend will be spooked out and scared by all your ghoulish tricks. Just be ready to clean up the mess afterwards as you're sure to make quite a scene in all the confusion. And before you put your Ouija board away, make sure to say goodbye to the spirit world just in case. While most laundry-related mishaps do not typically require medical attention, there are some rare scenarios that can result in serious injury or even accidental death. Have you ever wondered what happens inside a washing machine once the door closes and the machine is turned on? Can you survive if you were trapped inside? Let's take a closer look. One of the benefits of front-load washers is they allow you to fit more laundry into the compartment, which is great for efficiency. And to prevent you from accidentally opening the door while the machine is full of water, it automatically locks once the wash cycle begins. But this also means that if someone happens to be inside, they can't get out. As the limited space in the washer fills with water and you're struggling to breathe, the most pressing concern is obviously how to avoid drowning. 
Now, let's suppose you've lucked out and found an air pocket. You better hope the washer's temperature dial isn't set to hot. Standard washing machines are capable of heating water to 120 degrees Fahrenheit or about 49 degrees Celsius. That's hot enough for a serious scalding, and prolonged exposure to those temperatures can lead to heat stroke. But even with a cold temperature setting, you're still in for a pretty bumpy ride during the main wash cycle, and it only gets worse from there. The last stage or cycle in most washing machines is called the spin cycle. This cycle uses centrifugal force to separate and remove water from clothing by spinning at speeds of 1200 revolutions per minute. That's as fast as a DVD spins, which explains why most washer-related hospital visits are the result of injuries sustained from being tossed around inside while the machine is running. So be extra careful in the laundry room and never play in or around washing machines. What may look really fun from the outside is actually quite dangerous if you're unlucky enough to get locked inside. There's lots of stories of people surviving falls from incredible heights, including one of a woman surviving a fall from a whopping 33,000 feet after being sucked out of a plane. On January 26, 1972, flight attendant Vesna Vulovic fell an astonishing 33,300 feet from her airplane in the mountains of Czechoslovakia. Suffering from brain hemorrhage, several crushed vertebrae, and two broken legs, she was not expected to survive, but awoke from a coma two days later. But while events like that may be freak occurrences, what would actually happen if, say, you belly flopped from 100 feet high directly onto water? Well, first, water is soft and thus safer than the ground, right? Well, not quite. See, when you fall, your body begins accelerating, and the potential energy stored in your body is turned into kinetic energy. The longer a fall lasts, the more kinetic energy you generate, until hitting a peak maximum based off your mass and total acceleration. In short, the longer you fall and the bigger you are, the more kinetic energy you generate. But when you finally hit a surface and come to a stop, all that kinetic energy is then transferred to the impact site. Now when you hit a liquid, all of these same physics are in play. But as a dynamic medium, water can actually move and be displaced, which is why you can generally survive falls from a greater elevation. But with enough speed, mass, and kinetic energy, even a liquid like water can behave very, very unexpectedly. At a height of 100 feet, the average person will reach a velocity of roughly 80 feet per second, or 54 miles per hour. As your body impacts the water, it transfers all its kinetic energy to the water, forcing water molecules to move away. But at such high speeds, the water molecules are forced to move too much too quickly and encounter massive resistance from every other water molecule it pushes against. This creates a reactionary force that pushes back against the object, forcing the water to move, in this case, your own body. The greater the surface area, the larger the amount of water that is forced to try to get out of your way in a shorter amount of time, so the greater the force exerted back on you. That means that from a height of 100 feet and an average speed reached of 54 miles per hour, a belly flop carries a strong chance of outright death. Though even if you don't die, you may wish you had. At these speeds, water can exert so much force on your body that it'll shatter bones and rupture organs, causing massive internal hemorrhaging. While trained cliff divers do routinely make jumps from these heights, they have learned how to properly enter the water and increase their rate of deceleration, thus reducing the amount of force returned. So while it may look like great fun, maybe it's best to always leave the cliff diving to the professionals. If you want to make Fuzzy and Nuts happy, click that like button and subscribe to their channel. Isn't bedtime the worst? You've finally gotten all your work done for the day, and you can finally relax and do something you like, and then wham! Bedtime. Do you really need so much sleep anyway? Surely your body could function with a little less. How long could you possibly stay up? And what would happen if you stayed up for a week straight? The longest recorded time someone has gone without sleep is about 264 hours or 11 days straight. It was a high school student doing an experiment for his school science fair. He went through some pretty extreme side effects without sleep, but didn't suffer any serious consequences. Others haven't been so lucky.
Going without sleep for 24 hours or one full day isn't that uncommon. Sometimes you stay up all night cramming for a test, or maybe you're up playing video games. New parents commonly go without sleep because they're taking care of a newborn, although any new parent would tell you they would prefer to get some shut-eye. The effects of mild sleep deprivation can be seen almost immediately after a 24-hour period. Symptoms include sensitivity to light, irritability, impaired decision-making, memory deficits, vision and hearing impairments, increased risk of accidents, and, of course, drowsiness. But as soon as you get some sleep, these symptoms go away. Okay, well, what about a bit more? Say, two or three days of no sleep. Even though it's only a couple of days, your sleep cycle will quickly get out of whack. This system controls a lot of your body's basic functions. When you aren't following a regular sleep and wake cycle, the hormones in your body become deregulated. These hormones include cortisol, insulin, and the human growth hormone. As these hormones get off kilter due to your lack of Zs, you're going to notice some very intense side effects. Several bodily functions will start to fluctuate wildly like your appetite, your body temperature, and of course, your mood. You'll be totally unmotivated to do anything. Your attention span will be shot, reasoning and cognitive ability plummet, and your friends and family will notice speech impairment starting to kick in. Also, your immune system will be totally altered, and you can become very sick. Needless to say, you're going to have trouble staying awake, and you might experience periods of light sleep that only last around 30 seconds called microsleep. During these microsleeps, the brain is essentially offline, turning you into kind of a zombie. You'll be totally out of control and unaware of when these microsleeps happen, leaving you very confused and disoriented. After day three, it will be very difficult to stay awake on your own, and you'll need external stimuli to keep you awake. By this time, most people have had a really hard time with cognitive functioning. Multitasking, remembering, paying attention, and any decision-making are highly impaired. It's extremely difficult for people with this much sleep deprivation to complete even simple tasks. By this time, your emotions will be totally out of control. You'll become easily irritated and may even suffer a severe depressive mood, anxiety, or paranoia. After day four, you may begin hallucinating losing your vision and having trouble walking. And by this time, you're now putting yourself in danger of having a stroke or severe seizure, which could be deadly. In 2014, a soccer fan died after staying awake for 48 hours straight so he could watch all of the World Cup games. He suffered from a stroke brought on by sleep deprivation. And it isn't just staying up late one time that can impact your health. Chronically sleeping less than six hours a night increases your risk of stroke by four and a half times. During the day, our brain and body use up energy, and the breakdown of that energy creates certain byproducts. One of these byproducts is called adenosine, and over the course of the day, it builds up in our brains, making us sleepy. The only way to get rid of adenosine is by sleeping. During sleep, the brain activates the glymphatic system, a mechanism that flushes out the adenosine with cerebral spinal fluid. This system also gets rid of any toxic byproducts in between your cells that were created during the day. Your body needs to sleep to clean up and refresh the body. Think of it as the late-night cleaning crew who can only appear when all the lights are off and everyone's out of the office. The longer you go without sleep, the more these toxic byproducts build up in your body and the lousier you feel. And believe us when we tell you you're not the only one feeling bad. The people around you will notice your crabby mood, your various impairments, and they'll definitely be worried about your safety. So while staying up late and maybe even through the entire night might be tempting, remember that you won't enjoy it for long because there's really no way to avoid the side effects. So get into a comfortable bed, eliminate distractions, clear your mind, and get those Z's in. Everything can wait until the morning. Money. Every day, many of us make it, spend it, save it, or invest it. No matter what you do with it or even if you don't have any, our lives are still pretty much dependent on the constant flow of money. Some people dream of having slightly more money than they already have and going on a nice vacation or buying a new car. Others may dream of having millions. But what if someone told you you could have more than a million dollars? Much, much more. You could have a trillion dollars. The only catch? You have to spend it all in a single day. Is it possible to spend that much money in a single day? Is it possible to spend that much money at all? Every day consists of 24 hours, which means there's 1,440 minutes in a day. 
or 86,400 seconds in a day. So if you were able to spend $1 every second, you'd end up spending under 100 grand in a day. Even if you had a whole year, spending $1 each second only gets you to $31,536,000. And we're talking about spending $1 trillion in a day. That means we need to spend closer to $15 million a second. You need to think big, really big. What about throwing your dream party? Renting out an entire theme park and inviting hundreds of your friends like you've always wanted and buying everyone plane tickets to get there, private suites to stay in, or even better, you'll just rent the entire hotel. To rent out that theme park for the entire day, you just have to buy every ticket. Just for safety, let's say you purchase all 80,000 daily tickets for 100 bucks each, and the hotel has 100 rooms. You rent those too at $120 a room. Oh, and plane tickets for your friends. First class, of course, $2,000 each. And you pay for all the food because you're a really generous person. Let's say $100 per person for food all day long. Now that sounds like a party. But you're still a little short of a trillion dollars because that only adds up to $8,310,000. Not even close. At that rate, you would have to rent out the theme park and hotels for over 300 years straight. Let's face it, small things like food, jewelry, clothes, cars, and even all-day theme park rentals simply won't add up fast enough. You need something with a a larger price tag that you can buy much faster. What about that fancy yacht? It's nice, luxurious, and most importantly, expensive. If you get one clocking in over 100 feet long and equipped with everything you could dream of, it'll probably cost you around $12 million. At that price, you could buy one yacht every second all day long and finally tally your bill up to a trillion dollars. And all you need to do is purchase somewhere in the ballpark of 83,333 yachts. There's just one problem. There are only about 10,000 yachts on planet Earth, and only a few hundred yachts are actually manufactured each year, given labor, resources, and time. Even if you managed to convince the yacht builders to agree and produce a whopping 200 yachts a year, it would still take approximately 417 years of non-stop around-the-clock working to fulfill your $1 trillion order. In theory, is it possible to spend $1 trillion in a single day? <laughs> yes, but all of the red tape involved to purchase those various items or invest the money would actually take far longer than a single day. So it's probably not possible in the real world for a regular person. Sorry to burst your bubble, but money can't buy happiness anyway. We all love a good storybook tale of righteous kings and queens or fantasizing that we could be a brave knight on a heroic quest. But what if you actually were living during medieval times and found yourself not as a noble, but all the way at the bottom of the proverbial totem pole as a lowly peasant instead? What would you be expected to do? What kind of life would you live? How long would you survive the grueling lifestyle of a medieval peasant? Just like in today's society, there are certain societal structures in place during the Middle Ages. The structure is known as the feudal system, with the king or queen reigning at the top of the structure and owning all the land. They then give land to lords and knights in exchange for money, loyalty, and military support. Nobles then provided land and protection to the peasants, who were expected to work in exchange for living on the land, as well as paying taxes in the form of money or a portion of what they grew. Imagine the king having a whole pie. He keeps a big chunk of that pie for himself, then slices up the remaining pie for the lords, who in turn give some to their knights. And from there, some of the nobles give pieces of their pie to the peasants. But at the end of each year, the nobles take a piece of that teeny little slice back. Talk about unfair. So you get a piece of land, and in exchange, you work a little bit. That's not so bad, right? Well, the average peasant's life primarily circled around the agrarian calendar, meaning most of your time was spent working the land and trying to harvest enough crops to survive another year. And don't forget that tax you owe. Peasant men and women alike tended to the fields, and even their children were expected to learn the necessary skills to help out. Peasants' homes were constructed of a small wooden frame with walls of plaster made from a mixture of mud, straw, and plug your noses for this one, manure. Glass was extremely expensive, so windows were just a small circular hole in the wall. 
There was no flooring, just dirt, and no real insulation, so it was often extremely cold during the winter and unbearably hot during the summer. And not only does the family have to fit in the home, but the livestock as well. If left unattended outside, horses and oxen could roam off on their own or even be stolen, so you'd be sleeping side by side with your prized pig. To make matters worse, the animals would bring in bed bugs, lice, and other biting insects that would set up camp in the peasant's straw-stuffed beds. Peasant homes had none of the things we consider normal in ours today. No running water, toilets, baths, or basins of any kind. Even the king would barely bathe. There's a saying that a peasant only bathes twice in their life, once when they're born and once when they die as their bodies are being prepared for burial. Working hard, barely having enough food, and having less than stellar living situations makes it pretty difficult to survive medieval times as a peasant. If you're born into serfdom, there's only a 50-50 chance of surviving your first year of life, and the average life expectancy is only 35 years old. The lack of clean water and modern medicine make it difficult to live to an old age. However, if you survive your childhood and teenage years, it's possible to live well into your 50s or 60s. One of the worst plagues to, well, plague the earth, first appeared during medieval times. The bubonic plague, also known as the Black Death, is a gruesome disease that knocked out one-third of Europe's population. Due to the lack of sanitary awareness, fresh water, and modern medicine, the disease spread like wildfire. While those higher up in the power chain did fall ill with the bubonic plague, the nasty bacteria did its worst on the peasants. Although the horrifying Black Death ran rampant and killed thousands of people, it actually might have been the cause for a shift in the peasants' economic status. Once the plague disappeared, there wasn't as many people to complete much-needed tasks, like harvesting the fields. These jobs fell on the peasants left standing. And because they were needed so badly, they were able to ask for higher wages to complete the exact same job they were previously working for little to no pay. Instead of paying taxes with their crops and hard work, they were able to pay with actual money. From there, everyday life changed along with the overall economic structures. The tough life as a peasant was never-ending. Spending your life working to pay back the lord of your land or, you know, landlord, you get it, and essentially giving that piece of the pie back to the king himself. But hey, all you gotta do is survive the deadliest plague and you too can earn a living wage. Thanks for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe for more Fuzzy and Nuts. Fuzzy and Nuts are helping us get a glimpse into our own past. But what or rather when have they gotten themselves into this time? Known as the Mesozoic Era, the age of the dinosaurs is split into three time periods, the Jurassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. 245 million years ago, the first dinosaur evolved from primitive reptiles, and up until recently, scientists believe the first true dinosaur was the tiny, one-foot-tall Aoraptor. However, a fossil discovered in Tanzania and recently re-examined has named the three-foot-tall Nyasasaurus perigtoni as the earliest known dinosaur. Ruling the Earth for 135 million years, dinosaurs completely dominated the land, sea, and even air. Yet mammals also existed alongside dinosaurs. But given the huge size of their reptile overlords, only the tiniest mammals managed to survive. With an evolutionary head start of millions of years, mammals couldn't catch up to the size and strength of dinosaurs, so instead evolved to be small and nimble keeping out of sight of the terrible lizards to avoid becoming a dino snack. This put an emphasis for mammals to become not just small, but smart, which may have led to greater intelligence. Small dinosaurs didn't fare much better, so they started to evolve and become bigger. This triggered an evolutionary arms race between predators and prey, with both becoming bigger and meaner in order to avoid being a snack or to try and get one themselves. But some dinosaurs took different approaches, growing armored plates and bony horns or protrusions to use as weapons. Yet others, the sauropods, stuck to the original plan and grew big. Really big. Really, really big. These giants grew to astounding proportions, with the biggest sauropod ever, the Patagotitan, reaching an incredible length of 92 feet and standing 22 feet tall while weighing more than 10 bull African elephants put together. That effectively made the Patagotitan completely unhuntable, even by Spinosaurus, the largest carnivorous dinosaur ever discovered, which was barely half its size at 41 feet long. 
That's okay though, as there are plenty of other smaller prey for this giant carnivore. But could humans have ever lived alongside dinosaurs? And what would life have been like? It's thought that man evolved from apes after the climate started changing and the vast forests of Africa turned to savannas. With fewer and smaller trees, man's earliest ancestors were forced to walk the grasslands on two feet to find food. But that made them extremely vulnerable to predators, as they couldn't hide high up in tree branches anymore. This is why some scientists think that man only evolved because large carnivores began to die off, giving our earliest ancestors a fighting chance. So it's highly unlikely that man could have evolved in the age of dinosaurs. We would simply have been too easy a snack. Lucky for us, dinosaurs didn't last. And though the most widely accepted theory is that a meteor the size of a mountain wiped out the dinos, some paleontologists aren't so sure anymore, pointing at evidence that very few fossils actually exist anywhere within the timescale of the Yucatan impact event. These paleontologists think that dinosaurs were already on the way to extinction well before the meteor sealed their fate. With most dying off to parasites, disease, or other unexplained events, Whatever sealed their fate, we can all agree that we're better off with dinosaurs existing only in our imaginations. But did you know that the meteor that ultimately ended the age of the dinosaurs wasn't the only major extinction event in the Earth's history? Tune in next time for Fuzzy and Nuts' next adventure exploring all the times the world really did end. Working out, playing sports, or just being active in general is something that benefits everyone. There's long and short-term health effects like losing weight, keeping your blood pressure in check, and strengthening your bones. It's good for your mental health too and can elevate your mood and help you sleep. But for a lot of people, the main reason why they work out is for the look. But what's it like when you turn an activity into your entire life? Today we're going to take a look at what it's like to be a professional bodybuilder. The first step to becoming a professional at anything is putting in the time. And becoming a professional bodybuilder is no different. While the average person who regularly works out might go to the gym three or four times a week and stay around an hour, a bodybuilder is probably spending two to three hours in the gym every single day. And that doesn't even include the time you need to spend on planning your workout routines or doing research on the most effective exercises. All of these hours quickly add up. Before you know it, what started as a part-time hobby is taking more hours than a full-time job. Now, it might not sound like work, but a big part of the job of being a bodybuilder is eating. Your muscles need calories to grow, lots and lots of calories, while the average adult male needs to eat between 2,000 and 2,500 calories per day to maintain their weight, a bodybuilder who is trying to continue gaining weight might need to eat 10,000 calories per day or more. It's almost impossible to consume that much in just three meals per day. So most bodybuilders spread their intake across the day, eating six, eight, or even 10 meals per day. That's a lot of lunch breaks. And while just lots of calories in bulk will help you gain weight, to get a competition-ready physique, you'll need to make sure you're eating the right foods, what many refer to as eating clean, which requires even more time for research and meal prep. And then, of course, there's also all of the vitamins, supplements, and protein powders that many bodybuilders swear by. You can see that this would all quickly add up to hundreds of dollars per month just in food and supplements. But no matter how much time you put in at the gym or how many calories you consume, there's a limit to how quickly you can pack on the muscle mass. The average man can expect to put on half a pound per week or about two pounds per month at best. With most of the bigger bodybuilders weighing between two and 300 pounds, it can take years just to put on the weight needed to compete. But what can you get out of being a bodybuilder other than the big muscles? First, there's the prize money. You have to start with a local competition for amateurs, but if you perform well there, you can qualify for a professional competition. The biggest of the year is the Mr. Olympia contest, which pays out a whopping $400,000 to the winner. And more than just competing, there's also the chance at fame. Mr. Olympia helped launch the career of someone we bet you've heard of, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Not only did he turn and use his bodybuilding fame to become one of the highest paid actors on the planet, he even became governor of California. But of course, only a small number of amateur bodybuilders even get the chance to go pro, and an even smaller amount become household names. 
So what do you think? Would you want to become a bodybuilder? Do you think it's a good look? And is the potential for fame and fortune worth all the time and hard work you have to put in? Let us know in the comments. And don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe for more Fuzzy and Nutty. The American criminal justice system currently has roughly 2.3 million people locked up in more than 6,000 correctional facilities. And according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, there are more than 80,000 prisoners in solitary confinement, and it's one of the worst experiences a person can go through. What if you were thrown into solitary confinement? What's it like to live life inside that teeny tiny cell? And what effect would it have on your physical and mental health? It can vary from state to state and prison to prison, but on average, inmates in solitary confinement are kept isolated for 22 to 24 hours a day. Trips to solitary confinement, often called the hole, can be for a couple of days, weeks, or sometimes even years. In one especially extreme example, a prisoner was kept in solitary confinement for 36 years straight. You could wind up in solitary confinement for any number of reasons, from serious infractions like fighting with another inmate to minor ones like talking back to a guard or getting caught with banned items. So what's so bad about a little bit of alone time? Well, first of all, the conditions are terrible. Prison food already has a bad reputation, but many solitary confinement prisoners are only given something called Nutriloaf, a kind of bland log of meatloaf with almost no flavor and you won't be pulling up a chair to a table for dinner. No, most solitary confinement cells, if they have any furniture at all, consist of a small bed and a tiny table, both of which are bolted to the wall. But being alone can't do any physical harm, right? Actually, an inmate's physical health will often decline severely while in solitary confinement. Many inmates develop a number of conditions ranging from hypertension, chronic headaches, trembling, sweaty palms, extreme dizziness, and heart palpitations. <laughs> On top of that, due to the extremely small nature of their cells, prisoners' eyesight will often get worse. They become nearsighted and are unable to focus on anything far away. A lack of appetite and drastic weight loss is often accompanied with irregular digestion. And the effect of not talking to anyone for long periods of time can weaken vocal cords, making it difficult to speak for more than a brief period of time. Not only is a prisoner's physical well-being negatively affected, so is their mental health. Prisoners' emotions in solitary confinement can swing drastically, from feelings of panic to rage, irritability, hostility, or poor impulse control. Stress, panic attacks, feelings of hopelessness, withdrawal, and self-harm are all too common. Even when compared to prisoners within the general prison population, rates of self-harm, such as cutting and banging one's head against the cell wall, are particularly high. One prisoner said he was so starved for human interaction that he befriended a wasp that flew into his cell. He was so desperate for a friend that he would feed and have conversations with it. Cognitively speaking, solitary confinement can do a lot of damage to a prisoner's ability to process information. There are many reports of memory loss and impaired concentration with extreme confusion and disorientation in time and space. Because of this, many inmates are unable to read or watch television, which are usually their only available entertainment activities. Adding to the cognitive deterioration of the prisoners, the inability to maintain a coherent flow of thoughts often occurs. This disrupted thinking can lead to symptoms of psychosis. Psychosis is a severe mental disorder in which thought and emotions are so impaired that contact with external reality is lost. Inmates who exhibit symptoms of psychosis report experiencing hallucinations, illusions, and paranoia. Some prisoners' symptoms get so dangerous that hospitalization is required. Maybe the saddest part is that these physical and psychological repercussions to solitary confinement don't end once the prisoners are back in the general population or released from prison. It can take a lot of time and care to make sure the long-lasting mental and physical health concerns are addressed. What would you do to survive solitary confinement? Tell us in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more Fuzzy and Nuts! The fate of the Titanic is one of the most well-known maritime disasters in modern history. The supposedly unsinkable ship sank after colliding with an iceberg in the North Atlantic during its maiden voyage in 1912. And far more tragic was the loss of life that could have been prevented. Ever wonder whether you would have survived on board the Titanic? The RMS Titanic was a British passenger liner constructed in the early 1900s. 
measuring 883 feet long or approximately 269 meters with a total of 10 decks. It was, at the time, the world's largest ship and undoubtedly the most luxurious. There was a number of factors determining passenger experience, however the primary one, as you would expect, was based on the class of the ticket you purchased. The opulence and grandeur of the rooms, dining areas and amenities available to first class passengers were far beyond anything that third class passengers could ever imagine. And let's not forget the unseen men who worked in the engine room to keep the ship moving. The Titanic's furnaces required over 600 tons of coal a day, shoveled by hand around the clock, by workers deep within the bowels of the ship. These men were known as the Black Gang because of the soot and coal dust they were covered in. The moonless conditions on the night of the tragedy meant the ship's lookouts were unable to see the approaching iceberg until it was too late to avoid collision. While it's almost impossible to believe, the Titanic carried only 20 lifeboats, which was nowhere near capable of accommodating over 2,200 passengers and crew that were aboard the ship. The women and children first rule applied when loading the lifeboats, beginning with the first class, of course. And as a result, the difference in survival rates across classes is staggering. In total, more than 1,500 people on board were killed. Upon being violently thrown from the deck and plunging into the freezing North Atlantic water, one survivor described the lethally cold temperature as being stabbed with a thousand knives all over your body. The list of first-class passengers included some of the wealthiest and most well-known people in the world. So it's no surprise that the ship was carrying an estimated $6 million of cash, jewels, and other valuables on board. And while some passengers tried to save what they could, Sadly, most of the treasure sunk, along with the Titanic, to the bottom of the ocean. Fuzzy and Nuts have been hard at work bringing you their first official season, jam-packed with brand new episodes, so we thought it was only fair to send them on a well-deserved vacation. Many exotic tropical locales offer tourists a unique opportunity, the chance to swim with and feed small baby sharks. While everyone knows just how deadly their grown-up cousins are, just how dangerous are baby sharks? And what would happen if you were attacked by 100 of them at once? It's time to cut this vacation short and find out. Shark eggs can take anywhere from a few months to a year to develop, but some, like the rare frilled shark, can take as much as three and a half years to fully develop. Once out of their eggs, though, every single shark comes out a top predator. Because mother sharks don't stick around to care for their young. That means a baby shark needs to be ready to fend for itself the moment it's born. And it comes ready, with all the powerful senses of its grown-up counterparts. While having poor eyesight, sharks have an incredible sense of smell. And some can even detect the electric energy generated by a swimming fish's heart and muscles, which lets it pinpoint prey even in deep, dark water or inside caves, favorite hunting grounds of baby sharks. Along with their fully developed senses, though, baby sharks come with a full set of teeth, as many as 50 in all, and ready to deliver tiny little death bites to prey, ranging from small fish to shrimp and squids or octopus. So just how dangerous are baby sharks? And what if you were attacked by 100 of them at once? Well, the first point to consider is the teeth, pun fully intended. Most adult shark teeth are triangular and serrated, made for sawing chunks of meat off a dead fish or even a whale. Baby shark teeth, on the other hand, are often conical though, with sharp tips designed to puncture deep into flesh and hold squirming prey in place. Sizes vary by species, everything from just a few millimeters to as much as a quarter of an inch for a juvenile great white shark, which is well short of the three plus inch teeth of an adult. But when you consider that it has as many as 50 of these sharp little teeth, that's a lot of ouch in one mouth. The threat with being attacked by 100 baby sharks isn't necessarily going to be them causing massive damage to your body. They're babies and too tiny to have much strength or biting power yet. The real danger though comes from those 50 tiny teeth digging into your flesh over and over again, especially if they happen to bite you in certain parts of your body. Areas such as the skull and ribs are protected by hard bone, which their tiny teeth won't do much against and other areas such as the buttocks, outer thighs, and even the stomach can have layers of fatty tissue that protect internal organs and major blood vessels. However, there are several places where these major blood vessels run close to the surface of the skin, 
such as the inner wrist, the ankle, side of the neck, and inner thigh. These places all have major vessels that are well within the biting range of a tiny shark tooth, and puncturing one of these vessels, especially the femoral artery which runs along the inside of your thigh, would lead you to very quickly bleeding out. Baby sharks don't pose much of a serious threat to a person, but if you were swarmed by 100 of them at once, it's guaranteed that one of them would eventually find one of these critical spots and do some serious damage. Luckily, you don't have much to fear from sharks until they're grown up, and even then you don't really have much to fear anyways, because sharks are definitely not man-eaters. Generally speaking, as long as you leave a shark alone, it'll leave you alone too, as it looks for a delicious fish to feast on. So when summer comes back around, don't be afraid to hop back in the water. Deep in the jungles of Central America and South America lives a creature with the worst sting in the whole wide waspy world. It's an interesting insect that only stings humans when they're annoyed or upset, like when they're forced to be featured on an internet TV show. It's the Executioner Wasp. The Executioner Wasp is the largest of the neotropical paper wasp species, and it got its frightening name from how it devours its prey. Wasps are unlike honeybees in that they not only feed on pollen but on other insects as well. The mighty Executioner Wasp decapitates its prey and then chops up the remains to feed to its larva. Also known by its scientific name Polestes carnifex, it can be identified by its long body, bright yellow color, and bold reddish-brown stripes. It has an appearance that screams, stay away, I don't want to be on your nature show. But if you insist putting this wasp on the spot, it will sting you and it will hurt. But can it kill you? When an executioner wasp stings you, it releases a toxic venom into your bloodstream. This venom consists of a complex mixture of compounds that affect both the tissues of the body and the nervous system. First, the stinger delivers the venom into the body. Peptides and enzymes in the venom break down cell membranes, and the venom makes its way into the bloodstream. Some of those cell membranes will be neurons, and when they're hit by the venom, it immediately sends this very important message to the brain. Ouch! Wasp venom pain can be very intense. However, the pain is exaggerated by the body and is not actually indicative of the actual physical damage being caused, when it's just one or two stings, that is. The pain from a wasp sting doesn't immediately fade either. The pain will keep coming in waves thanks to a substance called norepinephrine. And as the final blow, haluronidase and MCDP in the venom continue destroying membranes by melting through connective tissue around the sting site. This is what causes swelling and redness associated with most insect stings. One or two stings from an executioner wasp can't kill you, but it will hurt. Some have even said it's the most painful wasp sting of all time. But if you get stung multiple times, 20 to 30 stings could kill you with the amount of venom delivered, if you don't receive medical attention fast. Also, there are some people who have an allergic reaction to bee and wasp venom. If they don't have access to an epinephrine or EpiPen, even one sting could be fatal. So let's try to leave wasps alone. Even if you're trying to be a viral sensation, just let those wasps do their thing. After all, wasps are doing the world a beneficial service by preying on potential pests to humans and keeping their natural world in balance. If you do bother a wasp and it stings you, you probably deserved it. Thanks for watching. Now go hit that subscribe button to really make Fuzzy and Nuts happy and to ensure that they can keep making videos and answering life's important questions for you. Volcanoes are an amazing, beautiful, and powerful representation of just how alive our planet is. These amazing creations of nature offer an amazing view into how Mother Nature functions and literally lets off a little steam. Many volcanoes, including active ones, are a popular destination for tourists as well as scientific inquiry. There are even some active volcanoes you can walk the rim of, at your own risk, of course. But what would happen if you fell right into bubbling lava? Would you sink like a stone to the bottom of the ocean, or would you float like someone relaxing in a pool? Let's start with the basics. There are around 1,500 known volcanoes on Earth. Of these, roughly 600 have been active in recent history, and between 50 and 70 are actively erupting each year. Many volcanoes have parks, hiking trails, and tourist centers surrounding them to provide education about this natural wonder. If you do visit, you must always be cautious as they're constantly changing and sometimes even release toxic gases into the area. Permitting that the conditions are safe and you can hike to the top, you can peer inside and see that strangely beautiful lava, or is it magma, or are those two words the same? 
The answer is… sort of. Ok, let's get some vocabulary set before we further explore. Magma and lava are both molten or liquefied rock. Magma is molten rock inside the Earth, whereas lava forms when magma reaches the surface of the planet through volcanic vents or eruptions. So to recap, magma is inside the Earth deep under the surface, lava is on the Earth's surface. That means if you fell into a volcano it would be magma that you're falling into since it's still technically inside the Earth. But what are you actually falling into? Magma consists of a very hot slush of crystals, volcanic gases and bubbles filled with volcanic gases. You might think that when you hit the magma you would sink into it, cause a splash and even be able to swim through it. The reality is quite a bit different. Lava and magma are significantly more dense than water, meaning that if you could withstand the high heat, you wouldn't sink, you would float. But magma isn't like a pool, hot tub or ocean, you're not going to be able to swim or float on it. Because of its extreme temperatures, generally ranging somewhere between 1200 and 2200 degrees Fahrenheit, you would burst into flames once you made contact with the magma. In fact, you would probably catch fire before even making contact due to the high levels of radiant heat, while the super hot gases would cause you to burn to a crisp inside your body. And remember what we said about the density? It's so much higher than water it would be like falling onto a concrete floor. Now you don't just have to worry about the extreme temperatures, but also the risk of breaking every bone in your body when you do hit the surface. Volcanoes are a powerful and unpredictable part of nature. They're beautiful and offer an incredible amount of insight into how mother nature works. Scientists have been studying volcanoes for hundreds of years, and while it's sometimes possible to predict an eruption, we can only do it with some certainty if there's a specific and thorough understanding of the activity of that particular volcano. Meaning that many times we can tell an eruption might occur, but there are still plenty of times when we have no idea. Terrifying! Volcanoes are incredible places to explore and learn about, but if you do decide to check one out yourself, please do it safely. Do your research before you go, learn about the daily changing environments at that location, and follow all park safety guidelines. And while lava flowing out of a volcano might look beautiful, be sure to keep your distance. Falling in is the last thing you want to experience yourself. The plague, also known as the pestilence, bubonic plague, and the black death has plagued people for, well, for forever. Outbreaks of this deadly disease have been noted since the beginning of recorded history, and there are even still outbreaks today. Today's cases aren't as deadly thanks to modern medicine, but what would it have been like to get the plague in medieval times before we knew how to treat it? During the largest outbreak of the plague, it's estimated that 75 to 200 million people across Europe, Asia and Africa may have died. And modern historians think that because record keeping was so poor that the actual number might be even higher. Close living quarters and quarantining entire families together helped quickly spread this deadly and painful disease. The bubonic plague is a disease that comes from bacteria that live in the soil. While in the dirt the bacteria isn't harmful to humans, once it's picked up by rats though it morphs into a different and more deadly form. This would still not be so bad, rats rarely bite humans after all, but fleas then bite the rats and pick up the bacteria. Fleas were very common in medieval households, which is bad news since when fleas bite humans the bacteria gets injected directly into the bloodstream, and fleas were a big problem for your average medieval peasant in their day-to-day -day life. Once in the bloodstream the bacteria quickly moves to the lymph glands, where the bacteria multiply and cause the glands to swell with infection. This creates one of the telltale signs of the plague, big black swellings at the sites of the lymph glands. These are called bubos and are extremely painful. The bubo is what gives the disease its iconic name, the bubonic plague. Once the bacteria have multiplied in the glands, they enter the bloodstream and go straight to the heart. From there they can quickly spread to the rest of the body. This causes everything from delirium to fever to raging thirst. The lymph glands continue to swell up until eventually they burst, both inside and outside the body. It is not a pretty sight. Also not a pretty sight, plague doctors who wore long waxed leather coats and large beaked masks filled with herbs to try and ward off the disease. Plague doctors had little to no scientific backing for their cures. They tried crazy ideas like applying piping hot stuffed onions to try to burn off the bubos. As you can probably guess, it didn't help and often made things worse. Inside the body, the burst debris from the gland enters the bloodstream, leading to clots that gather in the fingers and toes, cutting off the circulation and causing them to go black. The debris continues to clot in the bloodstream, eventually causing major organ failure and then death. 
The plague also causes pneumonia, which means a plague victim will be coughing up a storm that's full of plague bacteria. It enters the air and right into the lungs of another victim. It's estimated that the medieval plague killed between 30 to 50 percent of Europe's population, and while the mortality rate was potentially as high as 75 percent, that does mean that some people survived the disease. And modern science has shown that those people went on to live longer, healthier lives after the plague. <laughs> If you do get bit by a flea, that bit a rat that was rolling around in the dirt, don't worry too much. Modern medicine knows exactly how to treat the disease, so the odds of you ending up like a medieval peasant are slim. Volcanoes are some of the most powerful and mesmerizing examples of Mother Nature's fury. From far away, they're beautiful, and the lava seems to flow almost gracefully. But from close up, they're violent, hot, and wreck havoc on anything near them. That molten red lava that oozes out of the earth and slowly makes its way down the mountain might look pretty appetizing if you were on a long trek and dying of starvation. In fact, it might look like a red slushy. Funnily enough, scientists actually do describe its mineral contents as a slush. Oh, so tempting, but is it delicious? Probably not. But what would happen to your body if you ingested it? Can you drink lava like a beverage? How bad would it hurt if you did? First off, is lava even a liquid? Is it wet? Well, that's up for debate. The temperature of lava is far higher than the boiling point of water, so any liquid water would be gone. But lava does contain plenty of hydrogen and oxygen, the molecular components of water. Lava is also very viscous, which means it flows, but extremely slowly. In fact, it's 100,000 times more viscous than water. So while lava is definitely in a liquefied state, whether it's wet or not is still up for debate. Liquid but also boiling hot? Let's talk temperature. Lava's temperature ranges from 1200 degrees Fahrenheit to 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot, very, very hot. Really, it's so hot that almost anything close to it would burst into flames. When scientists have had to collect lava samples, they have to wear full-body protective suits. Despite all that protection, they still often get burns while retrieving it. Let's say you somehow manage to retrieve some lava in a protective vessel for drinking, and you get that vessel to your lips and pour the lava into your mouth. What would happen? First off, the lava is so hot it would likely burn everything in your mouth and completely incinerate it. If you did manage to swallow it, it would burn everything inside your body, leaving you in agonizing pain as it slowly destroyed your esophagus. If you were able to ingest the lava and somehow your body was able to cool the molten rock to a safe temperature, it would solidify inside your body and most likely suffocate you, starve your body of oxygen, and in turn cause many of your organs to fail. If by chance the lava did make it into your stomach, you would immediately perish. The lava would melt through your stomach and destroy all your internal organs. Doesn't sound too pleasant, does it? That's because the human body isn't meant to consume anything that hot. Think about it. It hurts to even drink tea that's too hot. Imagine that one time you ate a steaming bowl of soup or a hot cup of coffee and burned your tongue. Even that was extremely painful and may have even left your mouth and throat burned a bit. Now, it's likely that the temperature of that was between 160 and 190 degrees Fahrenheit. Multiply that sensation by roughly 12 to 15 times and that will give you a rough estimate of what it would be like to eat lava. If you still want to eat lava after hearing all of this, venture over to the Breath Report Cafe in Iceland where they serve up edible lava. Only this lava isn't made of molten rock, it's made of licorice, caramel, and egg whites and served at a reasonable and safe temperature. Eating lava is something that no one should ever do. You'd probably burst into flames before the spoonful of the molten rock even hit your lips, but the entire experience would result in one terribly painful situation and more than likely death. We'll take the lava made out of caramel served in chocolate cake every time. Humans eat a lot of strange and gross things. Snails, fish eggs, cheeses that smell like old socks, even bugs and spiders. But is it safe to eat these creepy crawlies? What about the venomous ones like black widows? People from around the world eat insects and arachnids all the time. In fact, it's estimated that over 2 billion people across the globe make bugs a part of their diet, and many are even considered a delicacy. Grasshoppers, crickets, ants, and cockroaches are fried, sautéed, preserved like jelly, or just eaten raw. A type of tarantula is eaten in Cambodia, and you can even buy them from vendors on the street, just like you could get a hot dog on the sidewalk in the United States. 
This might sound strange to you, but it's very common in other places, and they might think your hot dog full of mystery meat is more disgusting than popping a whole spider in your mouth. None of those bugs are venomous, so they're all safe to eat. But what would happen if you tried to eat a dangerous spider, like the brown recluse or a black widow? Just the thought of their long, spindly legs and hairy, fat, slime-filled abdomens makes us want to gag. But is it also dangerous to eat them? What would the venom do to your body if you could choke one down? Would it make you sick? Could it even kill you? The most dangerous spider in the world isn't the black widow or the brown recluse, but the Brazilian wandering spider, which has the world's deadliest spider venom. Just one little bite from one of these can leave you in serious trouble. Their venom is strong enough to quickly kill small animals and will eventually kill an adult human too. If you tried to pop one of these bad boys in your mouth, you'd be likely immediately bitten in the tongue or throat, and it would be just as bad as being bitten anywhere else on the body. You'd feel immediate searing pain, begin sweating, and the area you were bitten would start to swell, which could cause your throat to close up and prevent you from breathing. But what if you were able to tough it out and quickly swallow the spider before it had the chance to bite you? Well, we've got bad news for you, because you just made your problem even worse. Now you've got a deadly venomous spider heading down your digestive tract where it can bite you over and over again. But wait, wouldn't the spider suffocate or drown? No, thanks to their slow metabolism, some spiders can live without air for hours or even days. That means you can have a live spider biting you all the way down to your stomach. Yikes! No thank you! Ok, so eating them alive is definitely out of the question, but what happens if you eat one of those super deadly venomous spiders but cook it first? Maybe by giving it a little flash fry and creating a french fried spider fritter? You won't be winning any cooking awards, but would it still kill you the way eating an alive one would? Spider venom is made of certain proteins, and once the spidery snack got through your digestive system without any bites from the now incapacitated spider and it hit your stomach, the acid there would break the bonds in the venom proteins apart and render it harmless. Brazilian wandering spiders, black widows, brown recluses, all of them are safe to eat once the spider is cooked and dead. So while we still wouldn't recommend it, as long as you cook a venomous spider first, then you won't die. And who knows, with people becoming more and more adventurous, with what they eat and new food sources being considered all the time, you might just be biting into a Brazilian wandering spider sandwich in the future. Fuzzy and Nuts have been on a journey through time helping us answer questions like what were the worst natural disasters in history, what were some of the worst jobs ever, and what was life like in the Stone Age. Today though, Fuzzy and Nuts have landed 5,000 years in the past and are going to help us see what were some of mankind's earliest civilizations. Spanning an astonishing 30 centuries, ancient Egypt was one of the earliest and most long-lived of all human civilizations. It's thought that wandering tribes of hunter-gatherers began to settle along the banks of the Nile as far as 8,000 years ago. But it wasn't until about 3400 BC that the first true kingdoms arose on the Nile. The Red Land occupied the Nile River Delta and stretched south as far as Atfi, while the White Land in the south stretched from Atfi to Gebel el Silsila. It was a southern king, Scorpion, who made the first attempts to unify the Nile by invading the north. But it wasn't until 3100 BC that King Menes subdued the north and unified the country. Life along the Nile was far better than most other places, with the seasonal flooding providing rich farmland and abundant crops. The mighty Nile also allowed early Egyptians to freely trade up and down its length, moving goods easily from distant places. Known as the most prolific monument builders of all time, the ancient Egyptians lined the desert around the Nile with impressive pyramids, obelisks, and tombs, creating some of the few world wonders that stand to this day. Founded sometime around 2500 BC, Babylon is most widely known today for King Hammurabi and his ancient code of laws. Widely recognized as one of the earliest forms of civic code, the Code of Hammurabi was an extensive code of laws that dictated everything from laws, punishments, and policies, ranging from the wages to be paid to ox drivers or surgeons, to the liability of a builder for a house that collapses, and even provisions for judges who reach incorrect decisions and must be fined and removed from the bench permanently. An extraordinary progressive set of government policies for its time. Its like wouldn't be seen again across most of the world for thousands of years. But Babylon was famous for more than just the Code of Hammurabi, and was widely known throughout the ancient world for housing one of the most incredible wonders of the world, 
the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Described in ancient texts across nearly every civilization, the Lost Gardens featured terraces full of flowers and fruit trees, watered by ingenious mechanically driven water wheels that reached several stories in height. Despite their mention in texts around the world, no physical site for the ancient gardens has ever been discovered, leaving some archaeologists to believe that they may have been a myth all along. The most advanced civilizations of the New World, the Mayan civilization, got its start around 2000 BC. Rather than a unified kingdom though, Mayan civilization consisted of multiple city-states with complex networks of alliances or enmities, often waging war against each other. As Mayan rulers were expected to be powerful war leaders, constant raids for captives to sacrifice or enslave were part of daily life, and many smaller city-states quickly fell in line with their more powerful neighbors forming alliances. At the height of its power though, Mayan civilization sported the most advanced form of written language in the Americas and made great strides in the field of astronomy, with their temples having some geographical orientation to the stars above. Those temples, however, are best known for the practice of blood sacrifices, which in ancient Mayan civilization was seen as the best way to appease their belligerent gods. Human sacrifice, though, was the ultimate of offerings, and Mayans often sacrificed slaves captured in war. The world of the ancient Egyptians, Babylonians, and Mayans was a dangerous one, but as Fuzzy and Nuts will discover next time, there's been far more dangerous times to live in Earth's history. Everyone's done it. You plop down for a few matches of Fortnite, and the next thing you know, you've been building stairs over an enemy's wall to shotgun them in the face until 3 in the morning. But what would happen if you played Fortnite for 24 hours straight? With games like Fortnite becoming more and more popular, there's been an increase in recent years of news stories about video game addicts discovered dead after marathon gaming sessions. But what exactly happens to your body? And what risks are you taking when you play video games non-stop for really long stretches of time? The first risk you face from a 24-hour long Fortnite session is one familiar to many businessmen. Known as economy class syndrome, deep vein thrombosis used to be a major health issue for business travelers making frequent 12-plus hour flights. Often occurring in the legs due to long periods of inactivity, blood can pool and clot together until arterial pressure forces the clot to move along your circulatory system. Eventually, it can reach your lungs and block blood flow, where it causes a pulmonary embolism, leading to shortness of breath, fainting, and even sudden death. After experiencing deep vein thrombosis, an individual can also suffer from a complication known as post-phlebitic or post-thrombotic syndrome, where damage to their veins results in reduced blood flow and pain, skin discoloration, skin sores, and persistent swelling. The next risk you take from a 24-hour long Fortnite session is one familiar to many construction workers after a lifetime of lifting and straining with heavy loads temporary or possibly even permanent lower back pain. Modern chairs and couches can be extremely comfortable, but they force the human body to sit in a very unnatural position it wasn't designed for. If you've ever seen any nature documentaries with native people, you've probably noticed they don't own any chairs and squat a lot. That's because the squatting position is what the human body was naturally designed to do. Sitting the way we do in the modern world can put severe strain on the tailbone and lower back muscles, and that strain can badly weaken those muscles. While one single 24-hour Fortnite session probably won't be enough to damage you for life, too many in a row can lead to persistent back pain and lifelong injury. Everyone's heard about the next risk before, typically from an overly concerned mother. Sit too close to the TV and you'll hurt your eyes. While the reasoning isn't exactly accurate, you can severely damage your vision from staring at a TV or computer screen for 24 hours at a time. Computer vision syndrome or digital eye strain is caused by a variety of factors, including the distance from your screen. The biggest factor, however, is that while in real life ambient lighting levels don't often fluctuate drastically, colors remain relatively static and your focus rarely shifts. A computer or TV screen can display dramatic shifts in lighting, colors, and even focus in rapid succession as exciting scenes unfold in a video game or movie. This forces the eye muscles to work overtime and can lead to stress and fatigue, which causes a loss of visual acuity. Over time, the effects can even become permanent, specifically if you already suffer from vision problems, leading to lifelong damaged vision. The last effect of a 24-hour Fortnite session just might be the scariest since it's by far the deadliest. 
While it would probably take more than one 24-hour Fortnite session to develop, extended video game sessions have been linked directly to heart failure and death. Because of the high demands video games place on the brain, they tax the mind much more than exercise and can push an individual to greater depths of mental and physical exhaustion. Addicted gamers often push themselves past these limits, and given the already poor health of most of these marathon gamers, it can all prove to be too stressful to their hearts, which soon gives out on them. One 24-hour Fortnite session will probably just leave you exhausted and with some short-term eye strain, not to mention some serious B.O. But pack too many of them too closely together and you start taking some serious risks with your health. If you're one of these marathon gamers, remember to take care of yourself and follow our advice. Take short, frequent breaks and go outside once in a while for some light exercise. The battle bus will be ready to drop you into a new match in seconds as soon as you're back. No need to make yourself sick over it. You want to know what happens next week? Click the bell button and get notified as soon as videos get released. <laughs> Swimming is always a summer favorite for fun and cooling down. But if you don't know how to swim or get caught in a situation where swimming is difficult, it can be very dangerous. A carefree day can turn bad very quickly if you're not careful. But what does drowning actually feel like? Is it a quiet, peaceful experience like in the movies? Or are you panicking the whole time like in a video game when your breath meter is ticking down? When we see someone who can't swim in the movies, it's usually a very misleading version of what really happens. In fiction, it's usually depicted as someone screaming, waving their arms, and splashing around to show they can't swim. But in real life, drowning is almost silent. If you can scream, you can breathe. And if you can breathe, you're not drowning. Drowning is directly related to our breathing. It all begins when a person isn't able to keep their head and mouth above water. To the untrained eye, the person may not even look like they're in distress. People may begin to drown for a variety of reasons. They could be caught in a riptide in the ocean, where the current drags them under. Or it may be that the water is calm, but they don't know how to swim or float. Once a person can't keep their mouth above the water, the four steps of drowning start. First, the person holds their breath voluntarily until the urge to breathe becomes totally overwhelming. At this point, a person holds their breath automatically, but at a certain point, a reflexive response forces the person to inhale, which leads us to the second step. Water gets aspirated or breathed into the airways or gets swallowed. The third step, called cerebral anoxia, happens when the body detects water in the lungs and stops the breathing system completely. This happens because water enters the trachea and causes a spasm that seals the airways so that no more water can come in. This is the body's way of protecting itself. And finally, the fourth step, since no oxygen is reaching the brain, cerebral injury sets in and can be irreversible. The water that does reach your lungs can make red blood cells in your lungs burst and lead to massive organ failure. If the water you aspirate is salt water, it can mix with the burst red blood cells, causing your lungs to fill up with a type of plasma. Either way, it's a bad deal that feels like searing pain in your chest. Eventually, the person drowning will lose consciousness, and the next step is permanent unconsciousness. However, drowning does not necessarily lead to death if the person is saved in time, but it has to be quickly and the water has to be immediately extracted from a body with life-saving techniques. If a person does survive drowning, they could suffer lifelong consequences like major brain damage, acute lung injury, or pneumonia depending on how long they were underwater and if not treated properly. The best way to avoid drowning is by knowing the proper swimming techniques and staying out of the water when it's dangerous. Certified swimming instructors have classes year-round and teach all ages. Even babies at six months have been taught to float, so if you can't swim and are physically able to, then there's no excuse not to learn. But whether you want to learn or not, you can also take classes to learn life-saving techniques like CPR and how to extract water from a person once you get them out of the water. Every single year, an estimated 4.5 million people die from drowning, so you never know when you might be in the position to save someone's life yourself. Thanks for watching, and if you really want to make Fuzzy happy, hit that subscribe button and be sure to turn on notifications. They drive nuts crazy. See you next time. Coffin shopping is something no one wants to do, but when the unfortunate happens to loved ones, it can become an inevitably necessary task. The process can be stressful, sad, exhausting, and emotionally draining. But what if shopping for a coffin took a turn for the worst and not only became emotionally stifling, but literally claustrophobic? What if you were trapped inside a coffin? Could you survive? Is it even possible to get back out? First, it's likely that your instinct is to panic, and that's normal. It's a small space, barely large enough to move your limbs, and very dark. 
But don't get too worked up. When you panic, you use substantially more oxygen than you otherwise would. If you manage to calm yourself down to a relatively normal state, you could probably survive between two to five hours on the remaining oxygen. It's all dependent on how large you are, the size of the coffin, and how much air you may have already utilized in the initial panic. That may sound like a lot of time, but in reality, it's not. This is a sticky and uncommon situation, so you have to start thinking fast. And remember, don't panic. Today, the first thing to search for would be your cell phone. If by chance you do, you can attempt to make a call to someone and explain the strange situation. That, of course, relies on your phone having surface, which might be tough in a wood and metal box. A little light would probably make you feel more comfortable, but keep in mind that lighting matches is a bad idea. When a flame burns, it uses oxygen as fuel, eating up that valuable air at a much faster rate. Instead, use that cell phone as a flashlight if it still has battery life. The next step is to figure out which kind of coffin or casket you're in. If your loved one spent a lot of money on a metal casket, it's going to be next to impossible to get out. For one, they lock. And two, you won't be able to open the casket with all the weight of dirt on top of it. Hopefully, they went the cheaper and more environmentally friendly route. These coffins can be made of a thinner wood, bamboo, wicker, or even cardboard, and are often buried in shallow holes somewhere between two and four feet rather than six feet to help speed up the decomposition process. Less dirt means less weight and less dirt you'll have to climb through. Okay, so if this is the case, you have a slightly better chance of escaping. The next step might sound a little strange, but it's gonna feel more natural in the long run. You wanna slip your shirt over your head without taking it off your head, essentially creating a bag over your head with the sleeves dangling down. This will allow you to breathe without dirt filling your lungs. Now, find the weakest structural point in the coffin. It should be the center since there's no support of any kind. In fact, since you're buried in a cheaper coffin, the center may have even started to sag from the weight above it. Get yourself into a position where you can start kicking away at the top of the coffin until it breaks. Once the dirt's falling in, you want to fill the coffin with as much of it as possible. That might sound strange, but what you're really doing is displacing the dirt and weight that was above you. The more you can get into the coffin, the less you'll have to push through. Although, it's important to leave enough space where you can still move a little. This is because of your final step, standing up. We do it every day, but this time will be the most difficult of your life. An average height is roughly 5 feet 7 inches for a man, so if you're buried in that shallow grave and you're able to stand up, theoretically you could just about stand up out of the grave. But in order to do this, you're going to have to use all your strength, push hard against the bottom of the coffin, stick your hands as straight up as you can, and push through all that weight of earth. It's so heavy, it may even feel like you're pushing through concrete. A bit of good news, though. Because you were just buried, the dirt on top is likely still loose and not compacted, so pushing through it should be a little easier. Once your hands push out of the ground, you can start using your arms to pull yourself out and finally breathe that glorious fresh air. Although it is theoretically possible, it's very unlikely you would actually be able to escape from a coffin that's buried in the ground. With roughly 80% of the US coffins being steel, the odds are stacked against you being able to break out. But if you did manage to do it, it would be one amazing accomplishment of strength and problem solving. Do you have any idea for how to bust out of a metal coffin? Besides carrying a blowtorch on you at all times? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more episodes of Fuzzy and Nuts. <laughs> Floating in space. Ah, what grace, what freedom, what luxury. Did you know that outer space is basically the same as a vacuum chamber? There's no oxygen to speak of. That's why astronauts train inside artificial vacuum chambers before going into outer space. But what would happen if you didn't have a spacesuit on? Would your blood boil? Will you freeze to death? Will you explode? A vacuum chamber is an airtight, sealed-off space with all of the air taken out. There are very small vacuum chambers, some as small as a liter of soda. And then there are gigantic ones. The largest in the world is housed at a NASA facility in Sandusky, Ohio, and it's a towering 122 feet tall. It has to be this large to test spaceships under the depressurized and oxygen-free atmosphere of space. If you're in a vacuum, either in a laboratory setting or in outer space, what will happen to your body if you had a leak in your spacesuit? Or no suit at all? 
The first theory that your blood will literally boil in your veins is mostly untrue. The science behind this theory makes sense, because the lower the air pressure is, the lower the boiling point. Zero air pressure in a vacuum chamber means instant boil, right? Your blood won't boil inside you because it's part of a closed system, your circulatory system to be exact. Since your blood is not directly exposed to the atmosphere of no pressure, it won't boil you alive. Will you explode into a million tiny ooey-gooey pieces? Since our bodies are made up of tissues and muscles and ligaments that hold themselves together in a big bundle of skin, kinda gross when you think about it that way, our body parts won't go flying all directions into space. Your body tissue is simply too durable to be torn apart by the vacuum. Will you freeze to death? This idea makes the most sense, because outer space is freezing, right? Wrong again. The body, or any object for that matter, loses heat because of something called thermal conduction. That means that heat is transferred from one object to another through the air. But in a vacuum, there's no air, and therefore no chance at thermal conduction. There's nothing to transfer your heat to. It will stay contained in your body. So can you die in a vacuum chamber or in space? Yes, 100% you can die in a vacuum chamber or in space without the proper suit. And here's how. First of all, the air would be sucked out of your lungs and any other, um, orifice. Literally any and all air in your body will be sucked out by the vacuum. Due to the lack of oxygen, you will pass out in 10 to 15 seconds. Your brain starts starving for oxygen, and your organs will begin to shut down. The zero air pressure atmosphere will cause blood vessels on the surface of your body to burst, especially in your eyes. And remember how the boiling was mostly not going to happen? Well, there's a bit of you that will boil. Any exposed bodily fluids will begin to boil instantaneously. Vacuum chambers are amazing tools of science, but don't step inside one yourself unless you're with a real NASA scientist. And if you ever find yourself out in space, don't take the helmet off. Keep that spacesuit on too, otherwise you'll instantly sunburn like no tomorrow. If you haven't heard of the mighty Mentos and Diet Coke experiment, then where have you been? The world-famous experiment consists of combining super fresh and minty Mentos with that saccharine sweet diet and yes, it has to be Diet Coke. The reaction between the substances make for a huge foamy explosion that's sure to make a mess of your kitchen and ruin your day. But if you drank Diet Coke and ate Mentos, would it ruin your stomach? First, let's examine what's actually happening when the candy hits the soda. It starts a reaction that consists of a process called nucleation. Diet Coke is manufactured with a lot of carbon dioxide to give the soda fizziness, and that carbon dioxide dissolves into the water content in the bottle. The moment you open the bottle, the carbon dioxide changes back into a gaseous form. Basically, the CO2 changes from a liquid state to a gas state very fast, and when there are more physical places for the CO2 to land, then the process happens with a lot more volume. Think of when you pour soda into a glass by itself versus the glass with ice. When it has ice, there's a lot more bubbles. That's because there's more surface area on which nucleation can occur. Mentos tablets have a very rough surface despite looking smooth to the naked eye. When you get up close, you can see that the Mentos has a lot of uneven surfaces. This bumpy surface acts as a perfect site for nucleation. So when all that CO2 from the Diet Coke hits the millions of nucleation sites on the Mentos, it creates the incredible Coca-Cola geyser. Okay, but can that happen inside your body? It's been rumored that a boy died by swallowing Mentos and chugging a can of Diet Coke right after. But would this really happen? Will the two meet up down in the pit of your stomach and explode? If unharmed Mentos made it 100% intact to your stomach and you chugged a liter of Diet Coke, your stomach and intestines would fill up with gas, like a balloon filling up with air. The walls of your guts would stretch and distend until the tissue hits its breaking point, at which point they would be damaged and rupture inside your body. Something like this actually did happen to a woman who was celebrating the Chinese New Year, but Mentos and Coke weren't the culprits. She had overeaten and drank too much alcohol. When surgeons attempted to help her, large amounts of gas from the alcohol were released and came into contact with electrical equipment and caused a fire. Her stomach basically exploded and the doctors had to remove her stomach entirely. However, the Diet Coke and Mentos tale is an urban legend. You cannot die from eating Mentos and drinking Diet Coke because the rough surface of the Mentos begins to dissolve almost immediately in your mouth, so no nucleation can occur in your stomach. So while Coke and Mentos won't make your belly explode, overeating and drinking might. But even if there aren't any definitive reports of it happening, we still don't recommend you try it. 
leave the Coke and Mentos explosions in the glass instead of your stomach. And remember to do the experiment outside unless you want a big mess to deal with. Every day, we're surrounded by an overwhelming amount of diet advertisements, workout routines, gym memberships, recipes guaranteed to slim us down, and much, much more. But what if you decided to embark on your own diet program that was a bit more on the, well, extreme side? What if you didn't eat for an entire week? How would it make you feel? How much would your body actually change after seven days of no food? And most important of all, is it dangerous? First, let's talk about water. No matter what your goal is, you still absolutely have to consume water. Your body needs water to flush itself of waste, regulate temperature, along with a ton of other important processes, and humans can only survive about three or four days max without it. So no water will definitely not be part of this challenge. At the beginning, it might seem impossible to imagine not eating for an entire week. Most of us eat around three meals a day with the occasional snack or two, or ten in between. And sometimes, even on days when you're consuming a normal amount of food, you may find yourself getting hungry pretty quick. Once you subject yourself to a diet of not eating, also known as a fast, it'll take around eight hours for your body to start operating differently. Before that, your body was still expecting to receive the same amount of food as usual. This is why you may feel the most hungry or even like you're starving in the first hours and days of a fast. Now, let's look at how the body actually uses food. When you consume food, the body breaks it down and uses it for a variety of things. The primary result of that breakdown is glucose, which your body then uses as energy. But if there's no food coming into the body, then no glucose can be generated from the food. So instead, the body begins transforming glycogen, which comes from other parts of your body such as your muscles and liver, into glucose. Eventually, these sources of glucose production will also run out. And once again, your body will begin processing something else to convert into energy. At this point, it'll likely be fats and proteins stored in the body, which can provide energy for roughly three days. But after that short time period, the body will begin to make a huge safety adjustment and begin a process known as ketosis. Ketosis is the process that most people visually associate with a fast and not eating. Essentially, in order to prevent extreme muscle loss and lean tissue loss, the body begins the conversion of fat stores into ketones. By doing this, people experience extreme weight loss in a short time period. Depending on how much body fat you have, this process can last longer or shorter. Once the excessive body fat is burned away, the body will revert back to breaking down muscle tissue, which is likely the last store of energy left in the body. At the end of the week, depending on your initial size prior to the fast, there will be a noticeable difference in your physical appearance and a significant loss in weight. You may be tempted to go even longer, but keep in mind that the longest most people can last without food is between 40 and 60 days, and that's if you have proper hydration for the duration. After the fast is complete, you won't be able to immediately eat the same amount of food you ate before. You should start the process of introducing food slowly by consuming healthy foods such as fruits or vegetables and gradually increase as you feel comfortable. Although there can be positive results from fasting, you should always consult a doctor or a professional who is very familiar with your personal health prior to attempting a fast lasting a week. Sometimes fasting can be dangerous if there's underlying health issues that you may not be aware of and can cause permanent damage to your body or even death. No matter what, educating yourself on the different diets isn't a bad thing. Just be smart about it and don't do anything that makes you feel uncomfortable. Trust your body. And also, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe for more Fuzzy and Nuts. Our Earth is full of amazing ecosystems, full of organisms such as animals, plants, and insects, all dependent on each other to keep their ecosystem thriving. However, there are certain pesky organisms that provide nothing and only take from others in their ecosystem. These are known as parasites. It's estimated that parasites make up approximately 40% of all animal species. That's a lot of parasites. Some, such as head lice, can be quite common in humans, and although they're bothersome, they're easily treatable and pale in comparison to some of the deadliest and most horrific parasites out there. These scarier parasites can cause a number of life-threatening symptoms in humans, from stomach pain and digestive issues, brain inflammation, paralysis, and even death. One of the most horrific parasites out there is the screw worm. This diabolical parasite is not for the faint of heart. Its name says it all. The Latin term for screw worm is Cochleomyia homnivorax. The last part, homnivorax, roughly translates as eater of man, due to the fact that the larvae literally eat their way through the host until the host dies. Yikes! Two kinds of screw worms exist on Earth, but one is much worse than the other. 
For the most part, the Old World screw worm and the New World screw worm have very similar parasitic procedures. However, while the female Old World screw worm fly lays one batch of eggs at a time, the female New World screw worm fly takes things to the next level, laying a whopping six to eight batches of eggs or more. So how exactly do these flies laying eggs turn into an awful parasitic infection? Well, the female adult fly lays its eggs in an open wound of its new host. Then, in about 8 to 15 hours, the 2 centimeter long larvae hatch, causing excruciating pain and itchiness. They reach maturity within 5 days after hatching, resulting in up to 3,000 larvae being present in a single wound. From there, these small white screw-shaped maggots begin their flesh-munching takeover. Their persistent jaws allow them to chew their way nearly 2 inches deep into their host. Not only do these terrifying worms hatch inside an already existing wound, but they can also invade any mucus-covered tissue, such as your eyes, ears, or nostrils. And once they've made their way through layers of flesh, they can also dig their mouths into muscle tissue. Their textured spines on their screw-shaped bodies anchor them into the tissue, making them very difficult to remove. All warm-blooded animals can fall victim to these relentless parasites, from humans to livestock to pets. If there's an open wound, a female screwworm fly is sure to find a cozy home for its larvae. To make matters worse, these tricky little worms are very difficult to treat. There are no FDA-approved medicines available to treat an infestation of screwworms. There are, however, a few unconventional ways to treat screwworms that have worked in the past. One treatment option, which includes a savory breakfast item, is bizarre to say the least. In 2007, a 12-year-old girl arrived back in the U.S. after taking a trip with her parents to Colombia. What the doctors were about to encounter would shock them all. Upon examining her scalp, doctors noted what looked like fluid-filled bumps. They cut the young girl's hair to see better and were then able to identify moving larvae. The sample was sent off to a lab and was later identified as the New World Screwworm. Due to the young girl's pre-existing psoriasis, the female screwworm fly, which is present in Colombia, was able to lay eggs in the girl's lesions due to her scratching. You'll never believe what these doctors use to get rid of these ruthless parasites. Bacon Much like many Americans, these little bugs can't stay away from bacon. This bacon therapy includes jamming raw bacon into the wound. The worms try to leave the host as they're either enticed by the meat or as a way to avoid suffocation within the wound. After the bacon therapy, 142 larvae were extracted from the young girl's scalp. Located in the Western Hemisphere, the New World screwworm does most of its dirty work in Central and South America, although infestations have broken out in the United States, our last known outbreak being in the Florida Keys in 2016. So if you're traveling to Central and South America and get an open wound in any way, keep an eye out for the terrible screwworm fly. And at the very least, always keep a healthy supply of raw bacon on hand just in case. Now, go hit that subscribe button for more fun, and don't forget to turn on notifications to be the first to hear about new episodes of Fuzzy and Nuts. Fuzzy and Nuts have been on a trip through time, showing us what life was like with the dinosaurs, what the worst jobs in history were, and the worst natural disasters ever. Now they've found themselves in ancient China, smack dab in the middle of one of the worst wars in history. In the middle of the 8th century AD, China, ruled by the Tang Dynasty, was at the height of a cultural golden age. Yet major military losses on its borders to Arab armies in the west and the kingdom of Nanchao to the south had put severe strain on the kingdom. To turn the tide of bad luck for the Chinese army, Emperor Zhang Zong appointed one of his greatest generals, An Lushan, to lead a force of over 150,000 troops. On December 16, 755, though, An Lushan rebelled and turned his force against the emperor, announcing the formation of a new empire called the Great Yan Empire, with him as the first emperor, seizing the eastern Tang capital at Luyang, and then the main capital at Chengdu. An Lushan was poised to defeat what remained of the Tang when infighting started to tear his newly created empire apart. First, An Lushan was killed by his son, An Qingsu, who declared himself emperor and was then killed in turn by An Lushan's old friend, Xi Ximing. Xi Ximing continued the war against the Tang with great success, but he would shortly after be killed by his own son, Xi Xiaoyi. Proving to not be the military leader his father or An Lushan was, Xi Xiaoyi would lead his troops to ruin and commit suicide as the Tang retook all their former territory. The war devastated China, with death estimates ranging from 13 million to 36 million, and brought to an end a Chinese cultural golden age.
Not one war, but a series of back-to-back -back wars. The Napoleonic Wars were the direct result of one single man's ambitions. Napoleon Bonaparte, ending the chaos of the French Revolution. Napoleon created a strong, stable state with a formidable army, but believing France to be weak, a joint Austrian and Russian coalition waged war on France. Scoring his greatest victory, Napoleon crushed the Austrian and Russian forces at Austerlitz in December 1805, bringing an end to the war. However, concerns about increasing French power led to a new war led by Prussia and the Russians in October 1806. Napoleon quickly defeated the Prussian forces and forced Russia to surrender a year later in 1807. Peace fell on Europe for a short while, but in 1809 Austria declared war on France again. Napoleon would go on to decisively defeat Austria at the Battle of Wagram, but would suffer serious casualties. Hoping to shore up his control of a defeated Europe, Napoleon turned his attention to Britain and tried to isolate Britain economically by invading Spain. Napoleon simultaneously tried to invade Russia in 1812, but would suffer major losses. Encouraged by Napoleon's defeat, Prussia, Austria, and Russia aligned together and captured Paris in 1814. The coalition placed Napoleon in exile on the island of Elba off the coast of Italy. But Napoleon would go on to escape a year later and regain control of France. A massive alliance involving nearly every major European power would rise up against Napoleon and decisively defeat him at the Battle of Waterloo, after which he would be exiled permanently to the remote island of St. Helena in the middle of the South Atlantic. Taking place over 12 years of near constant fighting, Napoleon's wars would decimate Europe, killing between 2.5 million to 3.5 million soldiers and up to 3 million civilians. Just over a hundred years later though, humanity would see the most devastating war in all of history. World War II would span across the entire planet and involve every major power on the earth. With conflict from Europe to Asia and everywhere in between, the Second World War would kill over 25 million soldiers and a staggering 80 million civilians, or over 3% of the entire human population. This darkest of all periods in human history would last six years and would see the dual nightmares of the Holocaust and atomic bombings of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Though it would be the deadliest conflict of all time, as a silver lining the war would also strengthen the resolve of all nations to ensure lasting peace, leading to the creation of the United Nations and the longest period of peace between major powers in human history. World War II showed us what war can be like with modern technology. But have you ever wondered what life was like before any technology at all? Lake Natrone is a natural lake located in northern Tanzania, a country in East Africa. Lake Natrone is known for its beautiful colors, serenity, and for being one of the most inhospitable places for life on the whole planet. But how could that be? What could possibly be so bad about a naturally occurring body of water? Well, this is no regular lake. No, as you'll see, Lake Natrone is one of the strangest and potentially one of the most deadly places on Earth. Lake Natrone is fed by the Iwaso Nero River, as well as hot springs that are full of minerals. Because water flows into the lake but does not flow out, the lake's water levels vary purely from evaporation. And when the water evaporates, it leaves behind large amounts of minerals, like natrone, which was one of the main elements used by the ancient Egyptians during the mummification process. Lake Natrone is a strange place that has just the right geological conditions to make it filled with chemicals, salts, and minerals, all of which come together to make it very toxic and hard for humans to even live near. There are, though, a few animals that can survive and even thrive in it. Three kinds, to be precise. A small species of fish, algae, as well as a group of flamingos that love to feed off the algae. So if an animal can survive living in Lake Natrone, why can't you hop in for a little swim? Well, there's more than one reason why this isn't your ideal swimming hole. First, the lake's temperature can reach as high as 140 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot enough to do some serious damage. Just six seconds of exposure to water of that temperature can leave you with third-degree burns. But let's say you could somehow handle the heat. You've taken some pretty hot showers in your day, and you're ready to withstand any temperature of water that isn't boiling. Now what? Well, because of the deposits of various minerals and constant evaporation, there are large concentrated buildups of salt in the shallow waters that are almost like glass and can cut you up if you're not careful. And we know we said you could handle the heat, but once again, this water is really, really hot.
And the lake's dangers don't stop there. The pH of the lake has been shown to reach levels higher than 12. That's like swimming in pure ammonia. If you exposed yourself to those dangerous levels, your eyes, mouth, and any open wounds on the body would start burning immediately. And this pain would get worse, much worse, with more exposure over time. If you didn't learn your lesson and hop right out of the lake, your body would continue to be burned away, eventually leading to death or drowning. Once your body is submerged in the water, the minerals present in the lake would start going to work. And though it doesn't happen immediately, over time your body would become calcified and preserved. Muscles, organs, and sometimes even hair could become hard as rock. In the future, during a dry season when the water levels dip much lower than usual, if someone discovered your now visible remains, you'd resemble an ancient statue, frozen forever in the exact pose you died in. Many unfortunate animals have been found that ended up in this exact situation. They either died naturally and fell into the lake, or were unable to escape and now look like realistic statues. To date, though, no humans have been found who met the fate of becoming a living statue. Although Lake Natrone may seem intriguing, mysterious, and clear as a mirror, we don't recommend jumping into it. Because except for a very few animals adapted to it, everything that goes in usually doesn't come out alive. Want more episodes of Fuzzy and Nuts? Hit that subscribe button and be sure to turn on notifications. Then go into the comments and tell us what you want to see Fuzzy and Nuts try out next. Have you ever wanted to be in charge? Maybe a teacher at your school or the boss at your job. Or maybe you've dreamed about ruling an entire country. And not as an elected leader, but as the all-powerful king. Today, we're going to take a look at what it would be like if you were king. To start, we're not going to talk about modern royalty who are mostly figureheads and often legally have little to no actual power over the people. Instead, we're going back in time to around 1500 to a kingdom like England. You've just inherited the crown from your late father and take on a name worthy of a monarch. You ascend to the throne as King Fuzzy the Eighth. Okay, so you're the king now. So what? What kind of power do you actually have? Well, let's assume that you are a popular ruler and both the common people as well as your nobles love you. They see your rule as being a divine right. God himself wants you to be king and, hey, who are they to go against the big guy in the sky? They pass a law saying that even though there's a separate government in place, you have the ultimate say-so over things and can overrule any law they pass. You can even pass your own laws without parliament simply by proclamation. Basically, if you say it's the law, then it's the law. If you want to make a rule that everyone has to walk around with ducks on their heads, then hey, they have to do it. But like we said, you're a popular king and you want to stay that way, so you wouldn't do something like that. All that power must mean that you're pretty rich too, right? Well, you recently had everything you owned counted up, and when you have that much stuff, you need a whole team to help you figure out just how much you own. They took stock of all your jewelry, your artwork, your palace, your extra palaces, and then they came up with a value of 300,000 British pounds. They then counted up all of your military equipment like weapons, horses, suits of armor, and got to another 300,000. Now combined, that 600,000 pounds might not sound like much for a king, but that would almost be $250 million today. Not bad for one bear. So what do you do with all that money? You have fun. The king should be happy, so there were always plenty of parties. The king especially likes huge feasts with tons of food and dancing. There's also plenty of time for sports like tennis or horseback riding as well as other hobbies, like playing and listening to music. When you're the king, it just so happens that everyone wants to do the same things that you want to do. It can't be all fun all the time, though. Being the divine ruler means doing exactly that, ruling. Have you ever heard the phrase, heavy is the head that wears the crown? Well, if you had, then you know that as a king, you'll sometimes have to make some pretty tough decisions. As head of the state, you have to preside over parliament, as well as make decisions about the economy, the military, and foreign policy. Maybe there's a war going on, and you don't have enough supplies. That means you need to raise taxes to buy more. But then the nobles will be upset, and you need them to like you because they control the sources of the supplies you need. It can get so complicated that it would make your head spin. Luckily, you are a smart and fair ruler, and you're always able to come up with a solution to these problems in the end. So, now that you've had your long and successful rule, how might it all end? Well, if everything went smoothly and you weren't overthrown in a revolution or beaten in a war, hopefully now you have an heir that everyone can get behind as the next ruler. Now, if you didn't produce an heir with a clear claim to the throne, well, then there will likely be some rocky times as lots of people will see this as their chance to become king. But at least you won't be around to worry about it. 
So what do you think? Would you want to be the king? Would all of the work be worth the power and fun? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe to Fuzzy and Nutty for more fun. Anyone in the path of an approaching tornado knows to seek immediate shelter. But some adventurous storm chasers actually hunt down tornadoes to research and learn more about them. A tornado is a rapidly spinning column of air that can form when violent thunderstorms and certain wind patterns known as a supercell are present. These funnels extend from storm clouds all the way to the ground and are one of the most destructive natural disasters. Deadly twisters occur across the globe, but they're observed most frequently in a region of the US known as Tornado Alley, where hundreds of tornadoes touch down each year. Tornadoes are often preceded by a dark greenish sky and can sound like a roaring freight train as they approach. Torrential downpours, lightning, and even icy hail the size of a baseball frequently accompany these catastrophic events. Wind conditions approaching 100 miles per hour are not uncommon, with some tornadoes raging at speeds up to 300 miles per hour or almost 500 kilometers per hour, easily capable of demolishing homes, uprooting trees, and tossing vehicles through the air. Some survivors caught outdoors when a tornado hit described the terrifying experience as being sucked into a vacuum cleaner and then trapped in a cold, dark cloud of spinning debris with sudden bursts of lightning. The drop in pressure and powerful winds inside the vortex can feel like a punch to the stomach, sucking the air out of your lungs and making it difficult to breathe. But airborne debris is far more likely to cause injury. A tornado can turn an ordinary 2x4 piece of wood into a fierce javelin or a missile-like projectile that can easily impale you. Powerful funnels can travel miles in an unpredictable track for well over an hour before disappearing, leaving behind a trail of absolute devastation. So if you're ever in the path of an approaching tornado, find shelter immediately, ideally in a basement or underground cellar. But remember, just because the tornado is passed doesn't mean the danger is over. Do Fuzzy and Nuts a favor and click the like button. Also, check their video about what would happen if you ate the hottest pepper. Fuzzy and Nuts are helping us discover our own past, from the worst jobs in history to living alongside dinosaurs. It's time to take a look at the worst natural disasters in Earth's history. The Earth is the only planet we know of that supports life, but throughout its history that life has had some really close calls. But life never came closer to being wiped out completely than it did during the Permian-Triassic extinction event. Because it took place over 250 million years ago, it's been difficult for scientists to pinpoint the exact cause. But most agree that an event known as the Siberian Traps eruptions was a huge culprit in what scientists call the Great Dying. The Siberian Traps were a huge volcanic formation in what is present-day Siberia that began to erupt toward the end of the Permian period just over 250 million years ago. The exact cause for the eruptions remain unknown, though some scientists think they were triggered by a massive asteroid impact like that which may have killed off the dinosaurs, while others believe it was a ticking time bomb all along just waiting to go off. Whatever the cause, the Siberian Traps eruptions lasted for 2 million years and left behind 720 cubic miles of lava and volcanic rock. That's more than enough to cover the entire United States in several feet of red-hot magma. To make matters worse, the underground volcanoes erupted underneath several hundred meters of coal deposits, the remains of millions of years of plant and animal life, which ignited the largest firestorm the world has ever seen. This resulted in an environmental catastrophe, an acid rain with the pH of raw lemon juice, an incredible 96% of all marine life and 70% of all land creatures died in the years that followed. And it's the only known mass extinction of the most robust of all animal life, insects. Life got off lucky, and despite the devastation, the dinosaurs would evolve from the survivors and come to rule the world. But way, way back in Earth's history, life ended almost before it even got a chance to begin. In a disaster known as Snowball Earth, the Earth's climate began to suddenly cool 850 million years ago, 
And as the ice grew, it reflected more sunlight back into space, which resulted in even more cooling. In what scientists believe was a runaway process, the Earth became a giant snowball, with ice up to one kilometer thick in places. Though life consisted mostly of single-celled organisms, it was almost completely eradicated, and it wasn't until the discovery of deep-sea hydrothermal vents that scientists could explain how any life survived to evolve at all. Taking refuge in deep-sea vents, though, life did survive, and a gradual increase in volcanism began to release more and more CO2 into the atmosphere, warming up the planet out of its icy death grip. Volcanoes, acid rain, ice ages, the Earth has been through a lot. But it has never been through anything more violent than it did when it was just freshly formed. As a young planet over 4.5 billion years ago, the Earth was still in its formative stage, under a constant rain of asteroid impacts known as the Heavy Bombardment Period. Devastating as they were, all these comet and asteroid impacts actually helped bring water and precious metals to Earth to make it the world we know today. But then one day the young Earth suffered the greatest natural disaster in its history, an event known as the Theia Impact. With the second smaller protoplanet sharing a very close orbit to the Earth, only one of the two planets would end up surviving. And about four and a half billion years ago, Earth's smaller companion, called Theia by scientists, was on a collision course with the Earth. The force of the impact knocked the Earth into its current tilt, and the debris of the explosion would form into the Earth's moon. Devastating, but it's thanks to Theia that we have seasons and a moon that helps stabilize our orbit as we travel through space. The Earth has taken some pretty bad hits, and lucky for us we weren't around to see the greatest natural disasters in its history. But we're actually pretty lucky to be here at all, and it's worth taking a closer look at these times life almost went extinct completely. Ah, summer, beautiful sunsets, warm weather, beach trips, and of course, crab boils. While many of us enjoy this delicious food, have you ever wondered what would happen if the crab wasn't the one getting boiled? What if you were boiled alive? Would it hurt? Would you die? Could you survive? Well, first off, water boils at around 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius, which is pretty hot. And if a pressure cooker is being used to trap water vapor or steam, it can become even hotter, sometimes even rising up to 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so now that we've discussed some brief science of boiling water, what about pain? Well, before you even hit the surface of the boiling water, it's very likely you'll be met with a wave of pain from the steam. That's right, steam hurts. And if the pot is large enough for you to fall or be thrown into, it's very likely there will be a lot of hot steam. That scalding, hot, damp mist will touch your skin and cause immediate pain. You'll probably be screaming at this point or at least breathing more heavily, and when you inhale that hot steam, it's gonna scorch your lungs and throat and cause a severe burning sensation. Not to mention your eyes will be burning too. Once your body physically makes contact with the water, some people think maybe the shock will either kill you or be so sudden and intense that you won't feel anything. But unfortunately, that's not true, and the next several minutes or so will be very excruciating. The water is so hot that all of your skin will start burning and cooking. Your limbs will feel all this pain first, especially the areas that have a lot of nerve endings, such as your hands and fingers. It will send so many pain signals to your brain. Not fun at all. At this point, you won't look much different than a lobster. Your skin will be turning a bright red as your body pumps more blood to the surface of the skin. Swelling, irritation, and blistering will likely be happening too. The craziest part is that because the temperature is so hot, not only is the surface of your body cooking, but your organs are too. Literally just like a pot of pasta, meat, or vegetables, all the organs inside your body will be boiling and cooking away while you're still alive. That smell during all this might get a little strange too. It's not every day that we smell cooking flesh, organs, and limbs. By now the damage has gotten so bad that your nerve endings may be completely burned and destroyed. Those don't grow back, so if you're not pulled out by this point, that damage will be irreversible. Because the temperatures are so hot and your body is doing everything it can to survive, the composition of your skin may even change and actually begin sticking to your clothes. This makes it very difficult for rescuers to remove your clothes if you're pulled out. In some burning cases, victims' skin has been known to come right off when rescuers attempted to remove articles of clothing. If you did manage to get pulled out after all of this, chances are you'd already be dead. But if by some chance or miracle you were able to survive the brutal conditions, 
you would likely die soon after. Your body now would probably be covered completely in third-degree burns. Many of your organs are totally cooked through, nerve endings all gone or irreversibly damaged, blind, and now prone to infection. Unfortunately, many people have tried to go swimming or hot potting in natural hot springs and pools in national parks, often resulting in death. Some of them don't even make it out. In Yellowstone, a man was attempting to feel the temperature of a spring and ended up falling in. The water was so hot and acidic he died almost instantly and his body was never recovered. So next time you're close to a giant body-sized pot of boiling water or just a natural hot spring, be careful. You don't want to fall in because it will result in a lot of pain could cause severe permanent damage and may even result in death. Now go hit that subscribe button for more fun and don't forget to turn on notifications to be the first to hear about new episodes of Fuzzy and Nuts. Digging holes has been part of our life for, well, as long as we've been on this planet. Big holes, little holes, holes that go down for miles into the earth. Humans seem to instinctively want to dig just as much as your dog does in the yard. There are a wide variety of reasons why we dig holes, whether for construction, for mining, or for treasure hunters to look for lost pirate booty. When it was the prehistoric era, we might have dug holes like animals, for shelter, finding food, hiding food, or just for boredom. But how far can you actually dig by hand? Well, it depends on a variety of factors. One of the simplest factors is your height. You're limited by your height because you have to be able to remove the dirt and place it on the outside of the hole. After a certain point, you'll have gotten too deep and can no longer get the dirt out of the hole you dug. This is all subjective though. Obviously, one can dig a hole deeper than their height if they have external help from either someone else or a machine. Sometimes building a pulley system to haul the dirt out can also help. Congratulations, you've just discovered how to build a simple mine. Of course, even with the help of a contraption like that, when digging a hole by hand at a certain depth if the hole isn't reinforced and supported by an infrastructure, it can become dangerous and beyond what digging by hand is capable of. Obviously, the simplest form of digging tool is a simple shovel. In prehistoric times, a crude shovel made out of animal bones would do the trick for small jobs. Eventually, metal shovels would come on the scene, but they still only get you so far down. After the Industrial Revolution, steam and electricity took over. Eventually, large excavating machines became the standard for moving earth and digging large holes. Then there's the question of what happens if you dig too deep. Is it even possible to dig too deep? Well, it just gets more complicated. First of all, in most places, if you own the land and operate under the proper permits, you can pretty much dig as deep as you want to. But there's a good chance that after a certain point, you'll hit water. Congratulations again, you just accidentally dug a well. For most people, this means the end of their hole. But if you want to keep digging deeper despite the water, you have to acquire a pump. But the water has to be removed from the hole faster than it's filling it. So it better be a strong pump. But if you can get the water out, you're free to keep digging. The deepest hole in the world is in Russia and is over 40,000 feet deep. But even that hole is only a fraction of the way through the Earth's crust, and the temperature was already hundreds of degrees. But let's say the heat and the pressure weren't an issue. Even then, can you dig a hole to China? No, you can't. Antipodes are locations on Earth that are directly opposite each other. If the hole was dug in the United States, China is actually also in the Northern Hemisphere. It's impossible to reach it. If you were physically able to dig a hole to the other side, somehow surpassing the incredibly hot molten core of the Earth, you would most likely end up in the ocean, unless you're very lucky and hit one of the few small islands in the Indian Ocean known as the French Southern and Antarctic lands that are on the direct opposite side of the Earth from the United States. If you did get lucky and managed to hit those two very small and relatively uninhabited French islands and once again and were able to survive the Earth's super hot molten core, it would probably take you around 42 minutes to fall all the way through the hole and onto the other side. 42 minutes sounds like a long time to fall, but if you happen to have an important meeting on one of the islands and need to get to the other side of the planet in a hurry, this would be much faster than any other means of transportation, but also pretty much impossible. Studies have shown that many of us have an instinctive habit to dig for no real reason, but sometimes we do it for survival, curiosity, or even just fun. Remember, digging can be dangerous, especially the deeper you go. So always talk to an adult or local official first and dig with multiple people for safety. If you do decide to dig, let us know what you find. The freezer is a truly amazing invention that allows us to safely store food. When it comes to protecting you and your family from foodborne illnesses, chilling your food to appropriate temperatures keeps harmful bacteria at bay. Sure, this is great for raw cuts of meat or if you want a chilly popsicle on a hot summer's day, but what if you were trapped in a freezer? What could possibly happen to your body in those terribly cold temperatures? 
How long could you be trapped and survive to tell the tale? First things first, you're in for a very cold awakening. That's because walk-in freezers are kept at temperatures ranging anywhere from 0 to negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Not only that, but the ceilings, walls, and floors are usually made with 6 inches of insulation covered with sheets of galvanized steel, stainless steel, or aluminum. This is great for food, but for a person, you'd basically be locked inside a giant, tightly sealed, extremely cold metal box. At these sub-zero temperatures, your body begins to use its energy to keep your internal temperature as warm as possible. As your core temperature drops, your body shifts the flow of blood from your hands, arms, legs, feet, and skin and redirects it primarily to your chest and abdomen. This increases the risk of frostbite in your fingers, toes, and exposed skin. When your body can no longer preserve your internal temperature by constricting blood flow, you'll begin shivering to increase heat production. Frostbite can destroy tissue which can lead to permanent damage and even the loss of the frozen body part. Now you're well on your way to becoming a human popsicle. Once you've passed the frostbite stage, hypothermia becomes another risk. You'll start to feel a lack of coordination, slurred speech, and pale, cold skin. If hypothermia worsens, shivering stops and you'll experience mental confusion, shortness of breath, and an irregular heartbeat. In grave circumstances, there's severe muscle stiffness, extreme sleepiness, unconsciousness, and eventual death. Let's say you're wearing warm clothing and are able to stack up some boxes as a makeshift insulation to separate yourself from the ice-cold steel floor. You may be able to survive the freezing temps for a little while longer. However, another threat is lurking inside that giant frozen box. What about the air? The air we breathe is made up of 21% oxygen. When you breathe in oxygen, you expel carbon dioxide. Over time, the levels of oxygen decrease as the levels of carbon dioxide increase. This can lead to carbon dioxide poisoning, which can cause further confusion and fatigue, as well as vomiting and even brain damage. In England, a young woman got trapped for over 8 hours in the walk-in fridge at the fast food chain she worked at. The fridge was set to just a few degrees above zero. However, since she was only wearing leggings and her work t-shirt, doctors say she was on the verge of hypothermia. In an attempt to get help, she squeezed the message help me on a piece of cardboard with ketchup and slid it under the door. It wasn't until the morning staff showed up that she was eventually freed. Loss of energy and extreme muscle stiffness were experienced due to her chilly lock-in. Not only that, but she also experienced long-term anxiety well after her body physically recovered. Although these wonderful giant frozen cubes are essential for food safety, they can be quite dangerous and even life-threatening. So the next time you use a freezer, remember to enter at your own risk. And at the very least, always use the buddy system. Also, remember to hit that subscribe button. And don't forget to turn on notifications for more great episodes of Fuzzy and Nuts. The average person will spend about two years of their life showering and washing themselves. <laughs> but what would happen if you decided to take some of your life back and stop showering altogether? Many people actually shower too much. While a daily rinse is fine, you can make do with a scrub of your armpits, groin, and feet and save a full body scrub down for every other or even every three days. That's because your body naturally builds up a defensive layer against infection called the stratum corneum. This is a layer of dead skin cells bound together by fat cells called lipids that acts as a shield against bacteria and infections for the new skin being grown underneath. When you shower with too hot a water or scrub too often, you strip this layer away and can leave your skin unprotected, which can lead to infections or dry, itchy skin. But what happens when you don't shower at all? Well, the first thing you and likely all your friends will notice is that you'll start to smell pretty bad. <laughs> While we commonly assume this is because of sweat, it turns out sweat is actually odorless. The smell instead comes from bacteria that absolutely thrive in sweat and rapidly multiply out of control, releasing the pungent aroma of bad B.O. The second thing you'll likely notice when you stop showering is an explosion of acne across your face and body. Throughout your day, your skin is constantly secreting oils to help keep itself moisturized. When you stop washing, that oil can get backed up in your pores and cause blockages. 
dirt and other grime can also become stuck in all that oil and further block your pores, sending you straight back to your pimply-faced high school days. But some people are naturally resistant to acne and report their faces actually clear up when they stop showering. Though they may not suffer from increased acne, their dead skin cells normally removed by regular washing mm -hmm. would also begin to clump, glued together by oils secreted by the body. These oils would also trap dirt and other pollutants, creating large patches of dead skin which would gradually turn darker and eventually <laughs> become infected with fungus and bacteria. This could lead to the development of warty growths and leave you vulnerable to infections. Whether you shower daily or not, though, your body is always covered in bacteria and fungus. The average person has about 1,000 different types of bacteria and 80 fungi growing on them at any time. These are mostly beneficial to us, though, helping to crowd out bad bacteria and fungus and creating antimicrobial secretions that protect us from infections. But if you stop washing, they can start to grow completely out of control and eventually enter the eyes, mouth, nose, or ears, causing everything from internal infections to diarrhea. Everyone has skipped a shower or two, and though two years of your life may seem like a lot of time wasted, just cleaning yourself, trust us, it's worth it. While it's okay and even beneficial to limit how often you do a full body scrub down, not cleaning yourself at all is not just bad for your friends, but can be potentially really bad for your health too. You don't want to be the smelly kid at school, but you definitely don't want to be the sick one stuck in bed either. If you want to make Fuzzy and Nuts happy, <laughs> click that like button and subscribe to their channel. We've all been there before. It's 3 a.m., it's late, and you're preparing for an exam the next morning, attempting to cram as much last-minute information into your brain as possible. The only way to stay up and not fall asleep? Red Bull. But as every minute passes and every fresh can of that delicious energy drink is cracked open, is it too much? Can it be too much? Can you overdose on caffeine? Caffeine is a natural stimulant that affects the brain and the central nervous system. It helps prevent onset tiredness and keeps us generally more alert. Caffeine's primary function is on the brain. Once it hits your gut, it enters your body and bloodstream relatively quickly. Adenosine is a neurotransmitter in the brain that makes us feel tired and relaxes us. But once caffeine reaches the brain, it will connect the adenosine without activating it. So basically, we don't get tired when we should. We feel more awake, stimulated, and focused at a time when we might otherwise feel tired. Because caffeine enters the body and the bloodstream through the gut, it usually kicks in pretty fast. The amount of caffeine found in one cup of coffee generally takes 20 minutes or less to take effect. A can of Red Bull can actually begin making us feel more alert in as little as 15 minutes. So when is too much? It's generally accepted that up to 400 milligrams of caffeine is healthy and safe. That's roughly four cups of coffee. To put things in perspective, a single 8-ounce serving of chocolate milk contains 2.7 milligrams of caffeine. Decaf coffee contains 3 to 12 milligrams. Soft drinks contain 20 to 40 milligrams. Brewed tea has 40 to 120 milligrams. Energy drinks like Red Bull have 50 to 160 milligrams, while coffee and espresso can have between 120 to 720 milligrams of caffeine. Doctors say if you intake over the accepted 400 milligrams of caffeine, you can expect to start having some serious side effects. Those might include migraines and headaches, nervousness, increased heart rate, upset stomach, muscle tremors, and insomnia. Okay, so those are the general symptoms that might begin to take effect, but what really happens as you progressively drink more? Starting with one Red Bull, which represents roughly one cup of coffee, most consumers say they feel more awake, aware, and very functional. You may feel ready to take on a list of chores or do extra work, maybe even stay up studying for a few more hours. Now let's say things have escalated. It's getting later and you reach 20 Red Bulls. That's nearly 1,600 milligrams of caffeine. In Europe, a young woman used to drink nearly 20 cans of Red Bull each day. The repercussions were severe. Her liver was nearly destroyed and she gained an enormous amount of weight, jumping from a size 14 to a size 22. Not to mention her bank account was also hurting. Even when you buy Red Bull in bulk, 20 cans a day for an entire year is roughly $8,680 US. That's a lot of money.
Let's just say for fun that things get really bad and you consume 100 Red Bulls. That's nearly 8,000 milligrams of caffeine. This is serious health problem territory. Effects now escalate to seizures, strokes, and even hallucinations. In 2012, a user posted a review of 5-hour energy drinks claiming he had consumed 22 5-hour energy bottles all poured into a big gulp cup and consumed them in a very fast time frame. He said he hadn't been able to sleep in over 72 hours, no longer could feel his own pulse, and was suffering from hallucinations. Now the big question, what would happen if you consumed 1,000 Red Bulls? Really bad things, even if you could get past the severe dehydration that would probably occur early on, and the numerous other health problems that would manifest pretty early. Most likely you would have severe heart palpitations, and eventually can and probably will lead to a stroke. Your body's internal organs might slowly cease to function, including the kidneys and liver, and the possibility of death is serious, especially if you have a pre-existing health problem. In the end, caffeine isn't a complete evil. Some studies have shown that consuming a healthy amount of caffeine daily can actually help the body. It can improve brain activity and functionality, metabolism, and exercise performance. In some cases, doctors have found it may even help prevent heart disease and diabetes. But the overall effects caffeine produce are also subjective to each individual and based on their own body. Some people need more, some people need less, and some people don't even need it at all. The best bet with caffeine in energy drinks is to consume them at a safe, healthy level and not not overdo it. Always remember to hydrate in between and replenish your body with plenty of fresh water. The Bermuda Triangle is an area in the North Atlantic Ocean located between Miami, Puerto Rico, and the island of Bermuda. Over the years, numerous ships and aircraft have disappeared without explanation while traveling through this region. Notable examples include the USS Cyclops, a cargo ship with over 300 people on board that disappeared without a trace in 1918 and a group of five U.S. naval torpedo bombers known as Flight 19 that inexplicably vanished over the area in 1945 during a routine training exercise. There are dozens if not hundreds of similar incidents on record, and while some crews avoid the Bermuda Triangle whenever possible, others dismiss the stories of disappearing planes and ships as legend, coincidence, or just a string of bad luck. Reports of compasses going haywire, sudden changes in weather, electrical problems, and loss of engines are often the last radio contact before vanishing from radar. Without any way of determining the cause of these malfunctions and disappearances, imaginations have run wild. Some people believe that extraterrestrial forces or UFOs are responsible for the abductions, while others have proposed the triangle may be a wormhole to another galaxy. Recently, scientists have tried to connect the deadliness of the Bermuda Triangle with the possibility of strong whirlpools and powerful suction that could potentially pull huge items beneath the surface, while another theory involves strange cloud formations capable of creating air bombs full of wind with blasts as powerful as 170 miles per hour, a force capable of sinking ships and downing aircraft. Regardless of which theory you believe, it may be a good idea to stay out of the Bermuda Triangle for now, unless you're trying to disappear. Liquid nitrogen is great for making ice cream and breathing smoke like a dragon. But what if you drank an entire glass of pure liquid nitrogen? Is it dangerous? Could it cause your body harm? First, what is liquid nitrogen? As the name implies, it's the liquid form of nitrogen gas, a colorless, odorless gas that makes up about 78% of our atmosphere. Nitrogen turns into a liquid at negative 320 degrees Fahrenheit, much, much colder than the 32 degrees Fahrenheit of your glass of ice water. Being so cold, there's lots of interesting things you can do with liquid nitrogen, like add a fun foggy effect to drinks or flash freezing foods. But while this stuff may look fun, liquid nitrogen is extremely dangerous if not handled correctly, especially if it's ingested. First, what happens is that the majority of liquid nitrogen evaporates in your throat and turns into gas. There's a tiny flap in your esophagus called the epiglottis that is there to stop gas from escaping out of your stomach. This traps the cold nitrogen gas, causing it to expand, which can cause burns and internal rupturing. 
Things only get worse as the liquid nitrogen travels down into the stomach. As happened to a young woman in the United Kingdom, the extreme cold of the liquid nitrogen can burn holes in your stomach and destroy the stomach lining. The damage to hers was so bad that her entire stomach needed to be removed. If not treated immediately, this damage to the stomach and esophagus could even lead to death. So while liquid nitrogen may be useful for cooking and fun for party tricks, please do not drink it, because it won't be fun for very long. <laughs> Fuzzy and Nuts are on a trip through time, and along the way are teaching us about the greatest predators to have ever lived, the worst jobs in history, and the most terrible wars ever waged. But today our furry time travelers are coming face to face with some of the largest beasts to have ever walked the face of the earth. Possibly the largest dinosaur to ever walk the Earth, Argentinosaurus towered over the other dinosaurs at a whopping 50 feet tall while measuring 75 feet from head to tail and weighing in at 80 tons. This lumbering goliath was all but immune to predators, even from the fearsome Gigantosaur, one of the largest meat eaters to ever evolve. It's a good thing Argentinosaurus was so big and powerful too, because with a maximum top speed of 5 miles per hour, it wasn't going anywhere fast. But even at those low speeds, if a herd of giant Argentinosaurs were spooked, they would have absolutely decimated the landscape. Living in the middle Cretaceous, Argentinosaurus laid eggs that measured a whopping foot in diameter and were so big, it's thought they pushed the absolute physical limits of how big an egg could be without collapsing in on itself. This titan of a dinosaur may have been all but immune from predators, but if there was one predator that might have a chance of taking on an Argentinosaurus, it would have been living at our next destination. Living 100 million years ago, but on a different continent than Argentinosaurus, Spinosaurus was the largest carnivore ever discovered. Standing 14 feet tall and up to 59 feet long, Spinosaurus would have to been a terrifying beast to stumble into. Luckily for most other dinosaurs though, Spinosaurus was primarily a fish eater, having hollow teeth up to 8 inches long, similar to a crocodile's, and an elongated snout with nasal holes at the top of the jaw. This let Spinosaurus slowly cruise the ancient rivers and swamps of North Africa, feeding on fish such as the car-sized Onchopristus. Despite being primarily a fish eater though, it's thought that Spinosaurus also scavenged the kills of other carnivores, as its bite was too weak to kill big dinosaurs on its own. Armed with 5 foot long arms, each ending in 3 8 inch claws, what Spinosaurus lacked in bite it made up for in savage slashing power. Perhaps the most iconic feature of the Spinosaurus was its huge sail of which scientists remain completely at odds about its true purpose, some claiming it was to help regulate its body temperature, and others that it was merely for display to attract mates and intimidate rivals. If indeed used for mating purposes such as the display feathers of a male peacock, it's possible that male Spinosaurus had very brightly colored sails versus females, though the truth is sadly lost to time. Splitting off from other whale species around 1 million years ago, blue whales are the largest animal we have ever known to exist, measuring up to 105 feet in length and weighing up to an incredible 200 tons. Blue whales are not just the largest animal ever, but also the largest carnivore, though ironically they feed on the tiniest creatures in the ocean, krill. Taking in giant mouthfuls of water, a blue whale then uses its car-sized tongue to force the water past the fingernail-like material called baleen, which lines its upper jaws. This sieves out all the thousands of krill that are left behind and quickly swallowed. Blue whales tend to be solitary creatures and they were especially lonely in the early 1900s when they were hunted to almost extinction. Despite intense hunting though, blue whales numbers are recovering, but because of their extremely long age up to 110 years, blue whales are slow to reproduce and their population is today estimated at around 20,000 individuals, a far cry from the 300,000 plus that swarmed the ocean before whaling. Despite being the world's largest animal, this titan of the sea has been made vulnerable to extinction because of man's actions. But in the future, what might a world that man shapes look like? Electricity illuminates our rooms with a flip of a switch, cools off our homes on hot days, and it's even present inside our bodies. Our cells use electricity to send signals throughout the body and to the brain, making it possible for us to move, think, and feel. But what happens when we receive electrical currents from outside of our bodies? From a jolt of static electricity after walking over a thick carpet to a massive discharge from a power line, what toll would these levels of electric shock have on your body? How much electric shock can the human body withstand before reaching lethal levels? Electric shock occurs when an electric current flows through the human body, 
Imagine plugging a toaster into the wall. The power cord is sending electricity from the power in the socket to the toaster, allowing it to heat up your piece of bread. During an electric shock, our bodies become human power cords. We take electricity in and expel it somewhere else, passing the energy onward. The ability to conduct electricity is one of the marvels of the human body, but just like with junk food, too much can be a very bad thing. How badly you get injured by electrical shock depends on a few different factors. Not only does the current level matter, but also how long your body receives the electricity as well as the path of the current through your body. Currents that start at the hand can pass from hand to hand, hand to arm, hand to foot, or hand to head. It can actually take a very little amount of current to injure or kill a human being if the duration is long enough or if the path of current passes through or is near vital organs. When you boil it down, current level measured in milliamps is determined by the voltage amount and the resistance of your body. So let's say you stick a fork in an electrical socket, and warning, please do not try this at home. The average domestic electrical outlet supplies approximately 120 volts. Any voltage ranging from 5 to 500 can result in a current level of 15 milliamps. This is the maximum current level a human can withstand before sustaining life-threatening injuries. Currents above 10 milliamps can paralyze or freeze muscles. When this freezing happens, you're no longer able to release a tool, wire, or other object. In fact, it may cause you to hold on even more tightly, resulting in longer exposure to the shocking current. What if you find yourself sitting in the infamous electric chair? These death machines can produce up to 2,000 volts. Any voltage ranging from 100 to 10,000 volts can result in a current level of 100 to 300 milliamps. At this level of electric shock, you'd feel extreme levels of pain, along with likely experiencing cardiac or respiratory arrest, arrhythmia, a seizure, and eventually death. There's a well-known story that Ben Franklin, while studying electricity, flew a kite with a key attached to it during a storm and lived to tell the tale. However, this likely wouldn't be possible as a single lightning bolt packs a serious punch. One bolt of lightning can contain up to 1 billion volts of electricity. This is well over the voltage range of 6,000 to 600,000 volts, resulting in an unbelievable current level of 6,000 milliamps. That's 20 times the electric chair. At this range, electric shock may directly cause death by paralysis of the breathing center in the brain, paralysis of the heart, or ventricular fibrillation, which is uncontrolled, extremely rapid twitching of the heart muscle. It's generally believed that ventricular fibrillation is the most common cause of death in electric shock. In the United States, there are approximately 1,000 deaths per year as a result of electrical injuries. There are also at least 30,000 non-fatal shock incidents per year. So if you're not interested in becoming human toast, make sure to keep an eye out for damaged or fraying cords at home. And definitely don't go fly a kite during a thunderstorm. Ready to learn more? Hit that subscribe button and be sure to turn on notifications so that you don't miss an all new episode of Fuzzy and Nuts. Have you ever come across a small bee or a wasp and it scares you out of your mind? It might feel silly to be afraid of such a small insect. However, your instincts are right on track. Sometimes the smallest little bugs are some of the most dangerous, and that can include the bees and wasps that are in your backyard right now. When you hear buzzing coming from a nearby tree, you might immediately take notice. We really love honey, but nobody likes a bee sting. While a simple bee sting from a honeybee is unlikely to cause much harm, some people are allergic to a specific chemical in the bee venom. They can have severe reactions to the bee venom, causing them to go into anaphylactic shock that causes swelling and difficulty breathing. Luckily, a quick dose of epinephrine through an EpiPen can quickly counteract the bee venom. But if the person can't get that dose, they could possibly die. But there are bees and wasps that are dangerous even to those without a bee venom allergy. First off, there's the hybrid honeybee called the Africanized honeybee. These bees are an invasive species that take over local honeybee hives. These bees are more aggressive than your average honeybee. If they perceive a threat to their home, like a human accidentally disturbing their hive, the bees can go into hyper-defensive mode. They can swarm a person in a cloud of up to 60,000 bees strong, stinging the victim thousands of times. The stings from these thousands of bees can cause tissues and body functions to break down almost immediately. People have been known to suffer cardiac arrest and die almost instantly from these bee swarms. If you see a hive, stay clear and notify animal control to take care of it. But even those bees are no match for the giant Asian hornet. These guys are up to two inches in length and eat bees for breakfast, literally. They're a carnivorous species of hornet and contain a neurotoxin that shuts down their prey's nervous system. 
They're also prone to hyper-defensiveness. If a person gets stung by even one of these hornets, they can go into anaphylactic shock and die. The deadliest of all, though, is the Vespa luctuosa, a species of wasp found only in the Philippines. It has the most toxic venom of any bee or wasp, and only a couple insects in the whole world are known to be more toxic. A single bite from this little wasp is extremely painful and can lead to convulsions, your skin turning blue, and even death. Luckily for us, they rarely build their hives around humans, so unless you're walking through the Filipino wilderness, you're not likely to meet one. Whether you're allergic to bees or not, though, be careful. Some of them might be more dangerous than you think, so it's always best to keep your distance and not take any chances, even if you get a honey craving and see a hive. Under no circumstances should you disturb them. Leave it to the pros, and both you and the bees will be much happier. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe for lots more Fuzzy and Nuts. Nothing fascinates people quite like a bit of mercury. As the only metal that's liquid at room temperature, mercury doesn't quite behave like most liquids we're used to. That's because most liquids, well, they aren't metals. Mercury's viscosity is 1.5 times that of water, and its surface tension is 6 times greater. That's why it beads up into little balls so easily instead of smear when you spread it around. But mercury isn't something to play around with. In fact, it's one of the most toxic substances on Earth and even just touching it can cause severe health hazards. Contact with skin can cause severe irritation and even chemical burns, and within minutes, you could experience dizziness, vertigo, flu-like symptoms, burning and irritation, pale or clammy skin, irritability, and emotional instability. That's because mercury is a nerve toxin, and it directly affects the brain. Severe exposure can lead to madness and even death. But because mercury has a very high vapor pressure, it can vaporize at room temperature. So even if you can't taste or smell it, you could still be breathing in dangerous amounts of vaporized mercury. Surprisingly though, despite being one of the most dangerous poisons on Earth, up until the late 19th century, doctors would prescribe mercury as a laxative. That's because while its vapors are highly toxic and it's easily absorbed by the porous skin, mercury is not very easily absorbed by the specialized tissues of the gastrointestinal tract. That's not to say it's safe to drink mercury, far from it. But doing it once or twice shouldn't be enough to seriously harm you, and word has it that it's a very effective laxative. But we're okay with not finding out for ourselves. So what would happen exactly if you dove into a pool full of mercury? Well, the first answer is that you would almost certainly receive a very fatal dose of mercury poisoning as the metal made contact with all of your bare skin. You'd probably inhale a great deal of vaporized mercury, which would instantly go to work on your brain as we saw earlier. At such high concentrations, death would be certain. But remember how we also said earlier that liquid mercury wasn't like most other liquids? That's because it's far more dense, viscous, and has a much greater surface tension than water. Mercury's density is so great, in fact, that you could probably stand in a pool of it and only sink to about your shins. So trying to dive into a pool of it? Well, you wouldn't sink very much at all. Mercury is a pretty dangerous neurotoxin that can be easily absorbed through the skin or accidentally inhaled. Severe exposure can cause madness, blindness, chemical burns, and even outright death. But for all its dangers, at least now you know there's little chance of ever drowning in it. Summer is here, and that can only mean sunshine, blooming flowers, and bee stings. But what exactly happens when you get stung by a bee? And what would happen if you were stung by a thousand of them? First though, let's learn a little bit about the history of the bee. The first bees were descendants of a carnivorous wasp-like insect and appeared over 125 million years ago, evolving into pollen-eating and honey-producing herbivores. And though they were here well before us, cave paintings dated to over 10,000 years ago in Spain and France show that man and bees have a long history together thanks to that honey. Apiculture, or beekeeping, first began around 7000 BC in the Middle East, with honey finding use as food, medicine, and even preservative. The practice soon spread around the world from Egypt to Greece and Africa. And though famous for their stingers, most bees only sting in defense of the hive and give up an attack pretty quickly. Most bees, that is, with the exception of the legendary Africanized honeybee. 
also known as killer bees. They will pursue a threat for distances up to 3 miles. And if you think water can save you, think again. Killer bee swarms have been known to patiently hover and wait over water until their victim comes up to breathe so they can continue attacking. But what actually happens when you get stung by a bee? For that, we'll need to take a much closer look. A bee stinger evolved from its egg-laying organ, the ovipositor, so only female bees can sting. Once a stinger penetrates flesh, barbs along its shaft help it dig deeper into the victim, even after the bee has tore free the stinger. The stinger immediately begins to pump venom into the blood. Because the venom is about 88% water, and we are ourselves mostly water, the venom disperses easily through the body. So what exactly is in that other 12%? And why does it hurt so much? Half of a bee's venom is made up of a peptide called melatonin. Together with phospholipase A2, this toxic brew works to destroy cells, bursting red blood cells in the sting site. Apamin, which makes up about 3% of a bee's venom, directly attacks nerve tissue, causing further pain. While hyalurindase, which makes up about 2% of the venom, destroys cell membranes, allowing the venom to spread easier. As if that wasn't enough, this toxic brew also makes blood vessels expand, which is why bee stings can be so dangerous to people with low blood pressure. So what exactly would happen if you were stung by 1,000 bees at once? Most healthy people can tolerate about 10 stings per pound of body weight. According to the CDC, the average American weighs about 181 pounds, meaning most people could tolerate about 1,800 stings before death. However, even if 1,000 stings is far below this fatal threshold, there is the potential for serious and life-threatening complications. The most dangerous part of a bee sting is when it produces swelling in locations other than the sting site or when the sting site is in a particularly vulnerable area such as the throat. This swelling can compromise the airway and lead to asphyxiation. Because it also causes blood vessels to expand, all that venom can critically lower blood pressure, becoming potentially fatal for the sick or elderly. But even if 1,000 stings don't kill you outright, they can still be lethal days after the attack. When a bee stings you, it damages a great deal of cellular tissue and it's the kidney's job to eliminate this cell tissue and keep it from gunking up the body. However, if there's too much damaged tissue, the kidneys can't keep up and may be overwhelmed, leading to a shutdown. This is why people suffering from extreme bee attacks are typically hospitalized and closely monitored for a few days after. For the average human, 1,000 stings shouldn't be fatal, but approximately 2% of the population suffers from extreme allergic reactions that can be triggered by just a single sting. Bees aren't very prone to attacking people though, and with the exception of the Africanized honeybees, are quite tolerant of us. Most beekeepers don't even wear suits. So while they may seem quite scary, just remember, bees will typically leave you alone, as long as you leave them alone. Typically. If you want to make Fuzzy and Nuts happy, click that like button and subscribe to their channel. Going for a boat ride can be one of the most fun activities on a hot, sunny day. From cargo ships to fishing boats to cruise ships and beyond, there are so many different forms of maritime travel. But like with any type of travel, there are certain risks we face, like unexpected weather patterns, human error, or hidden icebergs. We're looking at you, Titanic. Any number of reasons can overturn a ship, causing it to sink. So what would happen if you ended up trapped inside a sunken ship? Are you doomed? Is there any way you could survive long enough for someone to rescue you? Your survival odds depend on a few different factors, one of them being the creation of air pockets within the ship. Air pockets can form when water slowly fills a room as a ship sinks but does not fill the room completely, thus pushing all the air upward to the top of a concave chamber, leaving an air pocket as the only source for oxygen. So if you found yourself in an air pocket, you're set, right? Not to burst your bubble, but not exactly. You also need to make sure that the air pocket stays oxygenated. When you breathe in oxygen, you expel carbon dioxide or CO2. CO2 accounts for about 400 parts per million or 0.04% of the Earth's atmosphere. At about 1,000 parts per million, you can expect to feel drowsiness in a standard indoor space. When the air becomes highly saturated with CO2 at about 2,000 plus parts per million, meaning the quality and duration of the breathable air decreases, you can experience headaches, sleepiness, confusion, or increased heart rate. When levels reach over 40,000 parts per million, permanent brain damage, coma, or death can occur. 
One upside of being trapped in the water is that CO2 is soluble, meaning the ocean can actually dissolve the CO2 molecules. The colder the water, the more CO2 can be dissolved, which is another upside due to the cooler water temperatures you're trapped in. More on that in a few. By splashing the water, the water's surface area is heightened, thus absorbing the CO2 molecules in the air pocket and lessening the amount of CO2 in the air. Maintaining an air pocket is a great start to survival, but there are still other factors that can limit your chances. Although the surface of the ocean can feel perfect for a dip in the summer, the temperature of the water below the surface drops drastically. The sunlight zone of the ocean, which spans from the surface of the water down to 200 meters, can range on average from 97 degrees to 28 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on the location. Temperatures in the ocean's layers below the sunlight zone drop severely due to a lack of sunlight and currents warming the water. Not only would these cold waters be a shock to your body, but the lasting cold temperatures would send your body into a hypothermic state, meaning your body loses heat faster than it can produce it. Cold water dangerously accelerates hypothermia, since body heat can be lost 25 times faster in cold water than in cold air. Lifting as much of your body out of the water as possible will help with surviving hypothermia. That way, your body has a chance to warm up. Food and fresh water will also make a play in your survival odds. The human body can go three weeks without food, but can only last a couple of days without fresh water. Although you are surrounded by salt water, you cannot drink it. Your kidneys produce urine, filtering out much of your daily salt intake. However, drinking salt water will create too much salt in your body that your kidneys cannot filter, actually expediting dehydration. Surviving being trapped in a sunken ship seems futile, but it is definitely possible. In 2013, Harrison Okene was trapped in a sunken ship for nearly three days. Even after he was rescued, his road back to normalcy was not over. Okene had to spend another 60 hours in the decompression chamber to rid his body of excess nitrogen. And then, even after surviving being trapped, he had to work hard to slowly regain his health and get his body functioning properly again. So whether you're going out for some exciting deep sea fishing or taking a pleasure cruise, remember an accident can happen at any time. Be prepared and ready to jump to action and maybe have an extra oxygen tank or two handy. Thanks for watching, and if you really want to make Fuzzy happy, hit that like button and then subscribe for more great episodes of Fuzzy and Nuts. Everyone's had the odd job they were forced to take when times were tough. And sometimes you could find yourself responding to some pretty odd job postings. Millions of people every day show up at laboratories and medical facilities around the world to be guinea pigs for dangerous drug trials or to test new gadgets and devices. While these jobs can be risky and probably more than a little weird, what are some of the worst jobs in the world that have ever existed? One of the worst jobs in history certainly had to be that of Punkawala, a royal fan bearer in ancient India. With temperatures reaching a whopping 122 degrees and humidity as high as 80 to 100 percent, it's a wonder that people survived before the invention of air conditioning. But survive they did, and while the common man was forced to endure the heat best they could, Indian rulers, or Maharajas, enlisted fan bearers to constantly fan them all day long. Being so close to the Maharaja, deaf servants or slaves were preferred for the role, as they wouldn't be able to overhear any secret conversations. Eventually, ceiling fans were invented, but without electricity, guess who had the job of peddling the complex system of pulleys all day long to keep the fans rotating? All that labor works up a lot of sweat, so it's a good thing getting clean is just one shower and a soap bar away. But for centuries, the process of making soap was dirty, disgusting, and more than a bit dangerous. Up until the Industrial Revolution, most soaps were made by combining animal fats, various oils, and harsh chemicals such as lime. First, animal fat was slowly melted and then strained to remove any meaty bits, then mixed with water and brought to a boil. The mixture was left to harden overnight, and the next day, lye would be slowly stirred into cold water. Because of its volatility, adding too much lye to water, or the reverse, adding water directly to lye, could create an explosion. 
Even if the mixture didn't explode though, it would heat rapidly due to lye's exothermic reaction with water. And without any protective equipment, any lye that got on the worker's skin would leave horrible burns. The fat mixture would then be added to the lye water mixture and blended for hours. Soap may leave you feeling fresh and clean, but it was definitely a smelly and dangerous affair to make for thousands of years. Melted animal fat can be kind of gross, but nothing tops the gross level of the next worst job in history. Medieval Europe is remembered mostly for epic stories about brave knights, but one thing it's not remembered for is its indoor plumbing, which did not exist in most medieval castles and villages. But people still had to use the bathroom, and all that waste definitely had to go somewhere. Enter the Gong Farmer, a polite term created for the peasants whose job it was to clean latrines, outhouses, and royal privies. Forced to empty cesspools of human waste with nothing more than buckets, gong farmers were responsible for digging, emptying, and then disposing of the waste of entire villages. While sometimes it could be used as fertilizer, often the gong farmer had to burn all of that waste in giant bonfires, creating thick, choking, and very smelly smoke. Exposed to all manner of diseases and parasites, gong farmers were the absolute lowest of the lowest social classes and often died of terrible infections. Even though our own jobs can often be stressful or difficult, let's at least be grateful that most jobs today aren't as disgusting or dangerous as those in the past, and that when work gets to be a little too much, we can always take a quick vacation for some much-needed R&R. But for Fuzzy and Nuts, their adventure exploring the past has just started, so make sure you tune in next time to see where they're off to next. The Earth is constantly being hit by particles of dust, tiny rocks, and other space debris. These small objects usually burn up high in the atmosphere, producing the shooting stars you may have seen while looking up at the night sky. But astronomers are always on the lookout for bigger asteroids, especially the ones that may be on course to strike our planet. While rare, these collisions with rocks from deep space do happen, and the results can be downright terrifying. An asteroid just 7 meters in diameter will explode with the power roughly equal to the atomic bomb that was used on Hiroshima, leveling buildings up to a mile away. A larger 100 meter diameter asteroid has more power than the largest nuclear weapon ever tested and could level an entire city. But there are even bigger asteroids out in space, and a run-in with one of these would have a truly global impact. An insanely giant asteroid, one around 10 kilometers in diameter, would create an impact crater 180 kilometers wide and 20 kilometers deep. Beyond just the impact, it would cause worldwide earthquakes and mega tsunamis over 100 meters high. Dust and ash thrown up into the atmosphere would cover the surface of the Earth for years. A massive die-off of plants and animals would follow, basically the end of life as we know it. And this has happened before. An asteroid of roughly that size is what we think killed the dinosaurs. And if an enormous asteroid the size of Earth were to hit, the planet would be completely obliterated, leaving nothing but the Earth's core and creating a new asteroid belt between Venus and Mars. But don't worry too much. Giant asteroids the size of the one that wiped out the dinosaurs only hit the Earth about every 50 to 100 million years. Of course, the last one was 66 million years ago, so I guess you could say we're due. We've all heard the recommendation to drink 8 glasses of water per day. And while the science is still out on exactly how much water you should drink each day, there's no doubt that hydration is essential. Each day we lose around 2 to 3 liters through normal functions like sweating, breathing, and going to the bathroom. But can you drink too much water? Believe it or not, you can. Known as water intoxication or water poisoning, it occurs when you drink more water than your body is able to handle. Your blood contains a certain level of sodium that your kidneys regulate. If that level drops too low, say by drinking more water than your kidneys are able to process at once, then your blood becomes diluted and watery, a condition known as hyponatremia. That excess water in your blood is carried around your body where it enters your cells, causing them to swell up like balloons. Now most of the cells in your body are able to handle putting on a little extra size, but there's one place where you definitely don't want that to happen. 
the brain. Your brain sits snugly inside the skull, which means it has no room to expand. As your brain swells and the pressure in the skull increases, blood flow is decreased, depriving your brain of oxygen. The first symptoms of water poisoning are headaches and nausea. But as the brain swells further, you can have trouble breathing, experience seizures, go into a coma, or even die. The exact amount of water needed to cause water poisoning varies from person to person and depends on a number of factors, like how much you're sweating. But most of the reported cases involve people drinking multiple gallons in just a few hours. So don't force yourself to drink more water than you feel like you need. If you let your thirst be your guide, you should be just fine.